today we are going to discuss in tomorrow's session and today's session budget of this year so why we need to know about the budget so this is the budget we are going to learn in the a comprehensive approach to this year's budget in accordance with upsc syllabus what is our main aim to crack upsc exam so in accordance with the upsc syllabus how this year's budget is going to be useful for us that is our aim not to know actual what is happening in the budget and all so in general every year with respect to budget in prelims two to three questions will be asked and in mains two to three questions again so after completing the two sessions on budget my aim is you should be able to easily answer those two to three questions in prelims and also those two to three questions in mains and also in between i am also going to give you some model questions also how a question can be framed with respect to budget okay so in general we are going to cover budget in a very comprehensive manner and no need to refer any other source after these two classes fine so and budget we are going to go discuss in some themes i have divided the total budget in some themes like agriculture external sector banking and finance like that so we are going to do the budget in a theme wise we are going to take each theme for example agriculture what are the new schemes or initiatives that have been introduced in this year's budget with respect to agriculture so like that according to that new scheme how is it important for prelims how is it important for mains okay both the aspects we are going to deal fine so first of all budget who prepares the budget it is presented by whom finance minister in the parliament it is presented by finance minister but it is prepared by budget division of the department of economic affairs so under ministry of finance we have one department called department of economic affairs which is going to prepare and in that there will be one budget division which is going to prepare the budget finally it will be presented in the parliament by the finance minister currently our finance minister is nirmala sitaraman very good so in the constitution what is the article related to budget it is article 112 but tell me one thing was budget word anywhere mentioned in the constitution no, no. so it is mentioned as annual financial statement it is not mentioned as budget so article 112 is about annual financial statement and what consists in this so in every year budget when it is presented three things will be consisted what are those first actual receipts and expenditure of the previous financial year so what is the current financial year even today we are in the march only so what is the current financial year 2021 to 2022 previous financial year means 2022 2021 next financial year will be 2022 so in the budget what will be mentioned actual receipts and expenditure of the previous financial year so what is the previous financial year this and along with that revised estimates of the receipts and expenditure of the present financial year because current financial year it is not yet completed so exact estimates anaim and dagara undu so what will be there in the last year budget they might have given budget estimates now we have revised them according to whatever we have done and at the end of the financial year actual estimates will be there that's why actual estimates of the last financial year we already have current financial year because it is not yet completed we will have the revised estimates and for the next financial year we will, we will have estimates of the receipts and expenditure that is budget estimates of the next financial year so these are the three things contained in the budget so what are the three things first one actual receipts of the previous financial year and revised estimates of the current financial year and budget estimates of the next financial year fine and in general budget at the end of the budget session two bills will be passed in the parliament at the end of the budget session two bills will be passed what are those two bills one is finance bill and the other is appropriation bill so what is finance bill related to 
finance bill is related to income side of the budget like changes in the taxes income side of the budget finance bill expenditure side ante a scheme meda enta kharchu pedtunnam the expenditure side of the budget will be there in the appropriation bill so at the end of the budget session these are the two bills that will be passed unless appropriation bill is passed whatever the expenditure that we are going to estimate in this year's budget that can't be taken by the government from the consolidated fund of india after the passing of appropriation bill only we can use the funds okay so two bills finance bill which deals with income side appropriation bill which deals with expenditure side next so budget is presented in three broad heads you might be knowing in polity you might have heard about this consolidated fund of india contingency fund of india what is the third one public account of india so what is the article related to consolidated fund of india article 266 and what is there in the consolidated fund of india first we need to know so it includes what does it include all the revenues revenue side of the government and similarly borrowings whatever the government is borrowing that will be included in the consolidated fund of india similarly recovery of loans this recovery of loans will be generally loans will be given to the state governments whenever the loan is recovered it will come into the consolidated fund of india okay so these are the three main aspects revenues borrowings and recovery of loans and is there any restriction to use the consolidated fund of india yes unless no amount can be withdrawn without the prior approval of the parliament without the parliament approval we can't even use a single rupee from the consolidated fund of india even if we have to use a single rupee we need to take permission from the parliament and in parliament it is passed through appropriation bill i have already told with respect to budget okay so without the approval of the parliament no amount can be withdrawn from the consolidated fund of india next contingency fund of india article 267 so it is placed that the disposal of president you have to remember this president in general in prelims what can be asked instead of president they can give finance ministry or they can give prime minister okay you need to remember contingency fund of india is at the disposal of president to meet unforeseen circumstances if ever there is any calamity or if ever, if at all there is any war or anything unforeseen circumstances then this fund will be used otherwise what will happen if we have to withdraw from the consolidated fund of india we will need parliament's approval it will take some time that's why to have in any unforeseen circumstances if we have to use some funds we are going to use it from the contingency fund of india and what is the corpus that means in the contingency fund of india what is the amount that is present how much currently it is 30000 crores but this 30000 crores is only from 2021 earlier that is before 2021 the limit was only 500 crore so in some of the books that you might be referring there may be 500 crore like lakshmikanth if you have old edition it will be mentioned 500 crore but currently from 2021 that is from the last financial year it was increased to 30000 crores and is there any restriction need for ex post facto approval what does that mean what is the meaning of ex post facto what is the meaning ex post facto law mere fundamental rights you might have heard about this word so what is that that means first we will use the funds later we are going to take the approval of the parliament okay in consolidated fund of india what we are doing prior approval is needed here first we are going to use the funds later we will take the approval of the parliament okay that is ex post facto approval fine next with respect to public account of india again article 266 and this is very 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 important for prelims what is included in the public account of india generally you might be knowing consolidated fund of india and contingency fund of india but there will be so much confusion about what is there in the public account of india so what are there it includes money held by the government in trust like provident fund small savings post office deposits etc 
So these are the funds held by the government in trust. Provident fund, you know, it is for the employees. Similarly, small saving, their schemes. We have small saving schemes. So the money that comes from the small saving schemes will be small savings. Okay, like that post office deposits. These are the money held by the government in trust and money set aside for specific purposes. So what are the several types of money that is set aside for the specific purpose like central road and infrastructure fund. While discussing infrastructure, I have told you one fund, infrastructure fund and I told you it will be in the public account of India. So one of the fund is central road and infrastructure fund and next PM Swastya Suraksha Nidhi and Prarambik Siksha Kosh. Similarly, Majamik and Uchitar Siksha Kosh and NDRF. What is NDRF? Disaster. Okay. Next, restriction. What is the restriction? That is with respect to parliament approval. Generally, most of the times you hear that for public account of India, no parliament approval is needed. But that is not the case. Not needed for trust money. That is first one. So, for the trust money, if you have to withdraw, no need of any parliament approval. But in the second case, that is specific purpose money, parliament approval is needed. Okay, if I give you one statement, if you have to withdraw any money from the public account of India, no need of any parliament approval, that will be wrong. Okay, for specific purpose money, parliament approval is needed. Only for the money held in trust, parliament approval is not needed. Okay. Next, two main priority areas of this year budget. So, this year budget that is 2022 budget, there are two main priority areas that the government has chosen. What is the first one? Increasing the capital expenditure. Capital expenditure means this is the investment we are going to do on creating some assets. Assets will be created like road, infrastructure, etc. And second, promoting inclusive growth and development. What is inclusive growth? We have already discussed. So tell me, what is the definition of inclusive growth? Inclusive, yes. The growth which is in general with respect to participative means. So everybody has to be involved in the process of development and everybody should get the benefits out of that equally. That is inclusive growth. So the second priority area is promoting inclusive growth and development. And for this, and this year budget is also a blueprint for the Amrit Kal. This word government is using most of the times Amrit Kal. So what is Amrit Kal? This year independence will be our 75th year of independence. So government is telling that next 25 years, that is till the 100th year of independence, the next 25 years we are going to call it as Amrit Kal. Okay, that is next 25 years so this year's budget is going to be a blueprint for the next 25 years okay that is what government is selling next increasing the cap i told you the first priority is increase in capital expenditure so how much it has increased we will see so the absolute value increased from so last year it was around 5.5 lakh crore this year it increased to 7.5 lakh crore so what is the percentage increase 35.4% so when compared to last year this year the increase in the capital expenditure is 35.4% similarly as a percentage of GDP this year it is 2.9% last year it was around 2.5% okay even as percentage of GDP there was increase similarly effective capital expenditure it is rupees 10 lakh crore that is 4.1 percent of GDP. So what is the meaning of effective capital expenditure? I have given here capital expenditure that is this amount plus grants given to the states for creation of capital assets. Generally grants will come under revenue account. Normally under capital expenditure what will be there? Money given to the creation of assets but sometimes through the revenue account government also provides grants for the states. Grant means what? Once we give, they need not repay that. It is not a loan. It is like a grant. No need to repay. So that grants generally they come under revenue account. 
but sometimes those grants will be given for creation of capital assets even if we include that then it will become effect to capital expenditure otherwise what is there in the capital account only if we consider that will be just capital expenditure in the next slide i will be explaining what is revenue account what is capital account what contains in that no need to worry so just understand that grants will be there in the revenue account okay and whatever the grants that are given for creation of capital assets if we include that also it will become effect to capital expenditure fine so classification of budget i told you just now we will have revenue budget and capital budget so what is the difference between them first we will see with respect to receipts revenue budget receipts are non redeemable non redeemable means whatever we are going to spend with respect to revenue budget that won't come back like pension grant or whatever with respect to capital budget these are the receipts which will create either a liability that means if we borrow that is a liability or it will create financial asset either it should create a liability or it should create a asset asset means capital expenditure and whatever the inflow capital receipt that will be in the form of borrowings so borrowing what will it, what will it create liability okay either it will create a liability or a asset next examples of receipts and budget receipts are classified into two types tax revenue and non tax revenue okay so tax revenue means direct taxes and indirect taxes so what will be included indirect taxes gst similarly direct taxes income tax corporate tax and this is also indirect tax only excise duty finally customs duty that is on imports and exports so in the declining order this is the revenue that the government gets from each of these that means whatever the revenue that the government get from tax collection the highest comes from what gst after that from income tax after that corporate tax but these two are almost same income tax and corporate tax sometimes corporate tax will be more sometimes income tax will be more almost similar just point difference that's it in the percentage if we take next excise duty and customs duty okay so this is in the declining order so in prelims questions will be asked like this only they will give all these receipts and they will ask you to arrange them in decreasing order or increasing order so this is very important for prelims you need to know the decreasing order and increasing order with respect to receipts okay next non tax revenue so what comes under non tax revenue interest receipts that means what i told you already center will give some loans to the states they are going to repay interest that interest will come under revenue account if they are going to repay the total loan that will come under capital account understood the difference interest will come under revenue but if they are going to repay the total loan back then it will come under capital next dividend and profits of psus because government is a owner of the psu whatever the money they get that will be included in the revenue similarly user charges like tolls and all and external grants if any country is providing us some external grant that will be included here but generally india has a policy of not taking grants from any country we don't take grants or gifts from any foreign country okay because we understand that it will undermine our sovereignty if you are going to take some money from other countries that's why even if there is some calamity even if some other countries offers us grant we don't take we never take okay but it will be included in the revenue budget similarly expenditure so these are receipts so revenue receipts means these things so what is revenue expenditure now so revenue expenditure will be recurring that means it will be happening from time to time for example salaries every month we have to pay salaries similarly pensions every month we have to pay pensions so revenue expenditure will be recurring that is incurred for purpose other than creation of assets if creation of assets it will come under capital other than creation of assets it will come under revenue 
revenue expenditure okay so examples of revenue expenditure i told you already interest payments even center might be paying some interest for whatever the loans it has taken from other countries that interest payments will come under revenue revenue expenditure if we are going to repay the loan back it should come under capital okay that difference you need to understand so interest payments subsidies one of the largest component on subsidy we are not going to get anything in return similarly salaries and pensions and defense budget grants to the states for creation of assets which i have already told you i told you that grants to the states for creation of assets it will come under revenue but they might be given for capital assets it might be capital expenditure but because it is a grant it should come under revenue expenditure otherwise it should come under capital expenditure okay even though we are creating assets because this is in the form of grant it will come under revenue if it is in the form of a loan it will come under capital account okay that is the difference so next with respect to receipts under capital budget that means what are capital receipts we have divided them into two types debt receipts and non debt receipts that means which are creating debt for the government so generally market borrowings will create debt for the government they come under capital receipts similarly non debt capital receipts what are those disinvestment recovery of loans whatever the disinvestment we are going to do with respect to psus edana oka company ni disinvest chesinappudu we will get some money so that money will be coming under capital receipt similarly we are going to provide loans for the state governments when we are going to recover that loan i told you it will come under capital receipts fine next capital expenditure capital expenditure it doesn't happen from time to time so that means it is non recurring fine non recurring means incurred for asset creation from time to time it won't be there only for asset creation we are going to use that money other than asset creation it will come under revenue and what are the examples creation of roads railways and loans to the states in general asset creation and loans given to the states they come under capital expenditure and on this table generally for every two years one question will be asked in prelims only from the single table you need to know what are revenue receipts what is revenue expenditure what are capital receipts what is capital expenditure and what are the components of that so one more time we will revise so revenue receipts are divided into two types tax revenue and non tax revenue in tax revenue you will have direct and indirect taxes in non tax revenue you will have interest receipts dividends and pro profits from psus user charges and external grants similarly expenditure revenue expenditure means on whatever the expenditure we are going to do which don't create any asset like payment of interest subsidies pensions salaries and also grants now with respect to capital receipts capital receipts are of two types one borrowing second recovery of loan or disinvestment capital expenditure means it should create a asset either we are going to incur create one asset like road railway or we are going to provide loans for the states okay fine next so last year budget we are going to analyze now with respect to receipts similarly what is the expenditure what is what is the last year's revenue expenditure what are the revenue receipts similarly in the last year but because we already have revised estimates of last year's budget fine so last year the budget amount was 2021 22 not next financial year current financial year so it was around 37.5 lakh crore this year how much do you think it is you might have read about yeah 39.4 2022 23 39.4 lakh crores what about andhra pradesh budget just i think two days back it was presented yeah around 2.5 lakh crore andhra pradesh budget but center budget 39.4 lakh crore this year last year 37.5 fine so with respect to this 37.5 we are going to see how much revenue receipts are there how much revenue expenditure is there similarly
capital receipts, capital expenditure. So, first with respect to revenue account, receipts. So, what is the total amount with respect to revenue receipts? 20.5 lakh. It is 8.8 percent of the GDP. And what are the components? I told you direct taxes and indirect taxes. And if you see this year, direct taxes and indirect taxes, they are almost same. Generally, the trend is direct taxes will be slightly more. It will be, let us say, this is around 5.6. This will be around 5.4. That is the general trend in the last five years. But this year, it was almost same. 5.4, 5.4. This is a percentage of GDP. Okay, that percentage. So, with respect to gross tax revenue, what is the amount? 25 lakh crore. But we need to consider not gross tax revenue, net tax revenue. How much? What is the difference between net tax revenue and gross tax revenue? I have already given here. So, net tax revenue means gross tax revenue minus state's share of taxes. Because state share of taxes is not center's amount. State share of taxes, it has to give it to the states. Even though center might be collecting the taxes, some share it has to give to the states. Understood? So, whatever the center is collecting, that will come under gross tax revenue. But they have to give some share to the states. So, that we need to minus. Then it will become net tax revenue. Similarly, transfer of NDRF. Two things. You need to remember these two things. Net tax revenue means tax revenue minus state share of taxes plus transfer of NDRF. If you are going to subtract that, it will become net tax revenue. So, what is the amount? 17.5 lakh crore. So, out of the total 20.5 lakh, 17.5 lakh crore is the tax revenue. That means, what we need to understand here? In the revenue account, out of the total receipts, tax receipts are almost 90%. Non-tax revenue is just around 10%. Out of the 20.5, 17.5 is tax revenue. So, what is there left? Just 3 lakh crore, non-tax revenue. Okay. When compared to non-tax revenue, tax revenue is very high. That you need to understand. So, what are the components? Direct tax and indirect taxes. This I, I have already told you in the decreasing order. GST, corporate tax, income tax, union access duty, custom duty. But I told you income tax is slightly more this year when compared to corporate. Generally, these two are almost same. Okay. Next, non-tax revenue, interest receipts, dividend user charges. No need to remember this order. Non-tax revenue, no need to remember in the decreasing order. But you need to remember these values, GST, corporate tax, income tax in the decreasing order. Fine. Next, with respect to expenditure, our receipts were just 20.5 lakh, but our expenditure 31.5. So, what comes under expenditure interest payments? Again, this is decreasing order, which is very, very, very important. Generally, so many times a prelims question was asked on this. Okay, arrange the revenue expenditure in the decreasing order. So, first highest is what? Interest payments, almost around 8 lakh crores, substantial portion, almost one fourth. So, one fourth of the revenue expenditure is just going for interest payments, which is actually not a good thing. Okay. And after that, subsidies, again, not that good. Similarly, salaries and pensions, this we have to anyway have to incur, that is okay. Defense expenditure and grants to states for creation of capital assets. How much it is? 2.4 lakh crore. Why we need to know these two values, we will understand later. Why I didn't give the other values? Why I have given only interest payment value and similarly grants to the states for creation of capital assets. How much? 2.4 lakh crore. You need to remember these two values. Fine. Next, we will see capital account. So, with respect to capital account, how much receipts? 17 lakh crore. And out of that, borrowings are 16 lakh crore. Okay. And non-debt receipts, obviously, just 1 lakh. So, just like revenue account, how tax revenue is almost 90%. Here, this is more than 90%. Borrowings. 
non debt receipts are just 1 lakh crore similarly with respect to expenditure no need to know the criteria i mean how much is what just two things creation of new assets and infrastructure loans and advances obviously this will be more fine so this is with respect to capital account and revenue account now you might have heard about budget deficit fiscal deficit and all so now we will see what is the definition of them and we will also see the value because we have already the data of the last year budget in terms of value also we will look at all those things so first and foremost what is meant by revenue deficit revenue deficit means revenue expenditure minus revenue receipts revenue expenditure minus revenue receipts so if i just go back two slides so what is the revenue receipt here 20.5 what is the revenue expenditure 31.5 so what is the revenue deficit now 31.5 minus 20.5 how much it will be 11 lakh crore so adhe kada ikkada undi so 11 lakh crore no need to remember this percentage but for budget deficit but for fiscal deficit you need to remember for budget deficit not much important next what is meant by effective revenue deficit so this is another term revenue deficit that means what is there here minus grants to states for creation of capital assets grants to the states for creation of assets so what is the revenue deficit 11 lakh crore which you have already seen just now so with respect to grants to the states for creation of assets i have already given you the value 2.4 lakh crore so minus 2.4 lakh crore so how much it will be 8.6 okay that's why i have given that value next what is meant by fiscal deficit this is very important out of all the deficits fiscal deficit is very important so total expenditure so total expenditure means revenue expenditure plus capital expenditure so total expenditure minus revenue receipts we are going to take the total of the revenue receipts and non debt capital receipts that means here we are not going to consider borrowings out of the total receipts we are not going to consider borrowings aspect of the capital receipts we are going to take the whole revenue receipt but in the capital receipts we are not going to take debt receipts that is borrowing so how much it will be total expenditure how much so here it is 6 lakh here it is 31.5 which is nothing but our budget 37.5 next revenue receipt how much 20.5 so 37.5 minus 20.5 plus this is how much 1 lakh non debt receipts so 37.5 minus 20.5 plus 1 and they got the fiscal deficit and so how much it is 16 lakh crore this percentage you need to remember 6.9 percent of the gdp okay so what is the fiscal deficit of last year 6.9 percent of the gdp no need to remember the value but you need to remember as a percentage of gdp 6.9 percent so that is fiscal deficit next primary deficit what is primary deficit fiscal deficit minus interest payments so i told you interest payments is 8 lakh crore fiscal deficit how much 16 minus 8 it will become 8 lakh crore fine so that we are calling primary deficit next effect to capital expenditure i have already told you in the starting whatever the money spent by the government on the assets plus grants to the states for creation of assets starting logo to japan again one more time so understood all the deficits very important for prelims okay with example also we have seen next with respect to budget where a rupee is coming from and where a rupee is going that means 
here before we have divided it in the form of revenue receipt and capital receipt now we are not going to divide it in the two types revenue receipt and capital receipt in general where rupee is coming from similarly we are not going to divide it in the form of revenue expenditure and capital expenditure in general where rupee is going fine and you need to remember these two things in the decreasing order both the things where rupee comes from where rupee goes to so this is a chart for that so with respect to where rupee comes from so what is the highest borrowings and liabilities so most of the rupee is coming from borrowing and liability after that gst this is 35 pais after that in the second place we have gst and then we have i told you these two are almost same sometimes income tax will be more sometimes corporate tax will be more this year income tax is more slightly these two are almost same next after that we will have union excise duties then customs and non tax revenue almost same and last we have non debt capital receipts so we need to remember the top 3 that will be sufficient borrowings and liabilities gst these two so this is where rupee is coming from fine next where is rupee going where rupee goes to so what is the highest here interest payments 20 paisa after that state share of taxes and duties next central sector scheme what is the difference between central sector scheme and centrally sponsored scheme uh, center sector scheme will be the center is responsible for that whereas the uh, center sector scheme will, sorry center sector scheme fully is sponsored by the center whereas center sector scheme state the center okay central sector scheme means 100 percent funding will be given by the center centrally sponsored scheme i think we will have somewhere yeah here centrally sponsored scheme means division between center and the state generally in the form of 60 40 it can be 50 50 also and for special category states 90 10 northeast states and special category hilly states okay so that is centrally sponsored central sector means 100 percent by the center and i told you pds is a central sector scheme so one example ayushman bharat centrally sponsored scheme okay examples now so first place we have interest payments second state share of tax and duties after that we have central sector scheme so we need to know the first three the rest of the things you can see defense eight paisa subsidies almost similar next finance commission and other transfers pensions other expenditure okay so first three you need to remember so by now we have understood what is there in the revenue account what are revenue receipts what is revenue expenditure what are capital receipts what is capital expenditure and we have also seen all the deficits fiscal deficit primary deficit revenue deficit all those things and we have also seen where rupees coming from where rupees going to next trends in the last five years and remember generally in prelims every year there will be one question on trends in the last five years or they might ask trend in the last decade or trend in the last two decades like that so the question will be in the last five years there is a steady growth or steady decline or fluctuation these will be the terms used either steady growth steady decline or fluctuating so we need to understand if there is any steady growth or if there is any steady decline or whether it is fluctuating so with respect to two important trends so first fluctuating trend in tax to gdp ratio in the last five years that means if we have to consider tax to gdp ratio it was actually not steadily increasing nor steadily decreasing fluctuating okay so in the question what can be given in the last five years there is a steady increase in the tax to gdp ratio 
or they can say after the introduction of GST, there is a steady increase in the tax to GDP ratio. But it is not there. It is fluctuating. So that is the first trend. Second, share of direct and indirect taxes is almost same. I told you this year. This year it is almost 5.4, 5.4. But before that, if you observe here, corporate is a little bit higher generally. So what is this line? Direct taxes. Direct tax a little bit higher when compared to indirect tax. But this year almost same. Next year projection again direct tax will be slightly higher projection next year okay so these are the two important trends next with respect to fiscal deficit i told you it is the most important thing so what contains in the fiscal deficit what are the components of fiscal deficit so there we have removed only one thing what is that borrowings out of the total expenditure we have taken minus if we have done total expenditure minus receipts, it could have been zero. And the total expenditure minus total receipts will be zero. But what we have removed from the receipts? Borrowings. So fiscal deficit, can I say, in general, it is the borrowings of the government. And then the fiscal deficit is nothing but borrowing, market borrowings of the government. So, what are the components of this? How government is going to the, do the market borrowing? Okay, we will understand. So, long term and short term borrowings. These things we have already discussed if you remember. Okay, what is T9? What is this? Treasury bills. Okay, and cash management bill we have already seen. So, cash management bill and treasury bills are the short term government bonds which I have told you and tell me whether they can be issued by the state or not treasury bills and cash management bills whether they can be issued by the state governments that is my question no they can't be issued by the state government and similarly they cannot be issued to the public also if you remember treasury bills and cash management bills they can't be given to the state government and I mean state government can't issue them similarly we can't provide them to the public fine next ways and means advances so this is a facility provided by the rbi to the central government in the form of loan okay ways and means advances by rbi so these are all short term now what are long term dated securities dated securities nothing but g sex government securities now tell me whether dated securities they can be issued by the state government or not dated securities by the state government yes state governments can issue dated securities they can't issue short term but they can issue long term and we call them sdls state development loans okay so dated securities of the state governments we call them sdl the meaning is state development loans but central government we call them g sex okay next securities against national small saving fund nssf means national small saving fund in general national small saving fund will come under public account but if you are going to issue any securities against that just like government security means against some money similarly if you are going to issue some security against nssf it comes under borrowing understood securities against nssf it comes under borrowing only nssf it comes under public account and all the borrowings they i have already told you they comes under consolidated fund of india first slide what contains in the consolidated fund of india borrowings also included so I am telling you if securities are issued against NSSF, it comes under borrowing. Only national small saving fund will be there in the public account. You have to understand this difference. Fine. Next, special GSEX like sovereign gold bonds. I have already discussed what is the sovereign gold bond in our class. Fine. Next, external borrowings. Whatever the borrowings we are going to take from the other countries, external borrowings. Similarly, receipts in the public account like state provident fund, etc. Okay. So, these are the components of fiscal deficit, long term and short term. 
next snapshot of government finances in general debt status of the central government only this slide is very 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 important both for prelims and mains this single slide is the most important slide in all of the budget what is the debt status of the central government so in general the total liabilities of the government is how much 135 lakh crore as a percentage of gdp it is 59 point sorry 59 percent 59 percent of the gdp almost 60 percent this is only central government state government will have around 29 to 30 percent of gdp as liabilities state government liabilities so total liability in general it will be even more this is only central government okay next liabilities are divided into two types one is public debt and the second one is liabilities under public account of india so always remember if there is given the term public debt then only these are the things included these are not included but in the total liabilities these are also included but if the term is used public debt then these are not included so what are there here national small saving fund similarly state provident fund and other deposits under public account of india but i have already told you if securities are issued against nssf it will come under consolidated fund of india borrowing so if you observe here here it is securities against nssf so securities and a word unte that will come under public debt otherwise it comes under liabilities under public account of india understood the difference okay now public debt is again divided into two types internal external so out of the internal debt we have treasury bills cash management bills ways and means advances dated securities in that manam teeskunna both long term and short term will come under internal debt and special gsex all these things and here observe almost 30 percent of the gdp is coming from dated securities so that is the largest component of the debt out of the 59 percent 30 percent is coming from just dated securities so if at all a question is asked which is the largest component in the public debt what is that dated securities next in external debt what we have loans from multilateral institutions multilateral institution means like world bank imf etc similarly bilateral debt that means one country giving loan to the other country for example japan is giving us loan for the construction of bullet train that comes under bilateral debt okay so our in the in our external debt the major component is multilateral loans bilateral debt is only just 30 percent okay so public debt means internal debt external debt and these are not included in the public debt okay so this is very very important slide fine next so with respect to trends in the center's debt to gdp ratio if you observe the least was 45.7 in the year 2018-19 just before the pandemic so before the pandemic our debt to gdp ratio is actually low just 45.7 percent but see how much it has increased very steep increase because our fiscal deficit has increased by a large amount before pandemic our fiscal deficit was around just 3.5 percent but currently it is around 6.9 percent and what is there in the fiscal deficit borrowing so debt to gdp ratio obviously it will increase okay so that's why this is the trend and again what will be the question if there is study increase or study decrease no neither study increase nor study decrease fluctuating trend all the three trends which you have seen till now are fluctuating only no study increase or study decrease similarly in the economic survey also we will see several aspects like this trends and on those things every year one question will be asked in prelims fine now we have one important act called frbm act 
so what is the meaning fiscal responsibility and budget management act frbm act why we need to know about this i told you this year fiscal deficit it has increased to almost 6.9 percent and next year projection is also 6.5 or 6.4 percent but according to frbm act how much it should be so we will see so according to frbm act there are some targets fixed in 2003 what is that reduce fd means fiscal deficit by 3 percent of the gdp by the end of march 2021 but did it happen obviously no similarly second target combined debt of center and state should be less than 60 percent but only center debt is 60 percent almost this year and i told you state's debt is almost around 29 to 30 percent so combined it is almost near to 80 percent but the target is 60 percent but before the pandemic the center debt is just 45.7 percent so center is actually in the trend to actually achieve this target but because of pandemic we have to increase our fiscal deficit and this target now we can't reach fine and this is by 2025 okay so before pandemic center is actually on the path to achieve this by 2025 because already it was reduced to 45.7 just it has to increase 5 percent in the next five years it could have easily happened but because of pandemic there is some problem next this point again same point here so escape clause a deviation of 0.5 percent is allowed that means from the whatever the target we have fixed 0.5 percent deviation is allowed but there are some conditions conditions applied what are those conditions these conditions are very important on this a prelims question can be asked what are the conditions under which there can be deviation from the fiscal deficit okay so national security war national calamity collapse of agriculture structural reforms like lpg reforms if or gst or something like that in general if there is any structural like demonetization gst they also come under structural reforms only or decline in the gdp growth rates only in these conditions deviation of 0.5 percent is allowed okay you need to remember these conditions a question can be asked in prelims next there are some statements that needs to be published under frbm act so what are the names medium term fiscal policy statement fiscal policy strategy statement macroeconomic framework statement medium term expenditure framework statement in last year prelims there was one direct question 2020 prelims they have given one of these statement and they have asked under which of the following this statement is published the options they have given economic survey budget frbm act and something so the answer is frbm act that's why you need to remember these four names direct question was already asked in prelims in 2020 prelims okay so what are the statements that need to be published under frbm act so with respect to that statement only medium term fiscal policy statement come fiscal policy strategy statement according to that according to the revised estimates what is the fiscal deficit 6.9 percent according to the budget estimates 6.4 percent that is for the next year just 0.5 percent decrease we are not going for fiscal consolidation fiscal consolidation means decreasing the fiscal deficit that we are not going we are going to spend money next year also our fiscal deficit is going to be high only and we have already increased our capital expenditure and capital expenditure most of the receipts are coming from borrowings only okay so if more and more borrowings we are doing means more fiscal deficit fine that's why next year also it is going to be 6.41 no need to remember the rest of the ones only fiscal deficit you have to remember so with that we have completed a overview of the last year budget and budget related aspects some basics of budget and overview of last year's budget and whatever we have discussed till now on that there can be one or two prelims questions now we are going to enter into the actual themes of the budget as i have told you we are going to discuss this year budget in several themes so first theme here i have selected is agriculture 
so under agriculture we are going to see all the initiatives that are introduced by the government this year okay so first and foremost comprehensive scheme for oil seeds comprehensive scheme for oil seeds and how is this important for us in the upsc aspect i told you we are going to discuss budget in the exam point of view not in the government point of view so what type of question can be asked here one mains question can be asked on this initiative so what is the question give an account of the various initiatives taken by the government to boost the production of oil seeds in india why we need to boost first of all oil seeds production it is one of the not one of the the first major export agriculture export is oil seeds or edible oil what is the second pulses yeah import import sorry major imports into india first is edible oil second is pulses so that's why we need to increase the production of oil seeds fine major import so what are the various initiatives taken by the government to boost the production of oil seeds also analyze the national edible oil mission oil palm which we are going to discuss now in the context of growing demand of palm oil in india and the major consumption of oil in india is palm oil out of the all the types of oils the major is palm oil but 99% of the palm oil we are actually importing major consumption palm oil but 99% we are importing that's why we have introduced one new scheme or new mission with respect to increasing the production of palm oil okay which we are going to see now so this is one kind of question that can be asked in the mains okay one model question now we'll see so what is the present status of oil seeds in india major oil seeds are nine some of the examples soya bean india the largest is soya bean consumption wise it is palm oil but production wise soya bean okay after that groundnut rapeseed mustard niger sunflower etc okay nine major oil seeds and area under cultivation with respect to oil seeds out of the total area under cultivation oil seeds is occupying 14% 27 million hectares mha means million hectares next production how much it is 33 million tons okay next largest producer states 1 2 and this is important for prelims so what are the three largest producing states in india madhya pradesh rajasthan maharashtra okay this is important for prelims they can ask in the decreasing order or increasing order fine next 60% of the edible oil is imported and edible oil is the second largest import in the agriculture products not second it is first okay so edible oil 60% we are importing fine so most of the need of edible oil in india is met through imports and palm oil i have already told you 99% next what are the initiatives of the government so what are the initiatives first one national food security mission oil seeds and oil palm under national food security mission we have several initiatives several sub initiatives either increasing the production of pulses increasing the production of millets rice wheat along with that we also have under national food security mission oil seeds and oil palm okay one of the component of national food security mission similarly pm aasha we have discussed it in detail there are three sub components under pm aasha and i told you some of the schemes are only related to oil seeds okay similarly higher msp is being provided for oil seeds so that there will be increase in the production next targeting rice fallow areas now we need to understand what is a rice fallow area so rice fallow area is like in some areas there can be mono cropping of the rice that means only they produce rice nothing else in one season they are going to produce rice in the second season they are going to leave the land fallow so we are going to target those areas for increasing the production of oil seeds understood one crop season there will be rice second crop season they will leave the land fallow instead of leaving it fallow we can actually produce oil seeds so we are going to target rice fallow areas 
next strategies to increase the production of oil so increase productivity through high yielding variety seeds just like how we have done it with the rice and wheat and i told you yellow revolution with respect to oil seeds it was actually not successful yellow revolution who is the person behind that anybody yellow revolution dr sam pitroda anu gurtu vastunda okay so with respect to yellow revolution it was not that much successful so increase productivity through high yielding variety seeds just like we have done it with the rice and wheat next promote intercropping that is one of the strategy we can use next organize farmers into fpos what is a fpo farmer producer organizations we have already discussed that what is a fpo and all farmer producer organization they can be either cooperative societies or there can be companies also if they are registered under cooperative society act they will become a cooperative society if they get registered under companies act they will become a company so farmer producer organizations next promote secondary sources such as coconut so where coconut is consumed in the food items in which state yeah. kerala so just like that instead of palm oil we can promote coconut okay so that is also one thing next awareness to reduce consumption of edible oil in general edible oil is not good for the health so we need to reduce the consumption of edible oil so that there will be no need for the import if consumption reduces there won't be any need for the import okay next coming to the actual scheme which i have asked in the question before that some facts 99% of the palm oil requirement is met through imports which i have already told you similarly largest consumption is palm oil and objective of the scheme national edible oil mission oil palm so so what are the objectives increase the area under oil palm from 3 lakh hectares to 6.5 lakh hectare what is the total area i have told you under oil seeds 27 million hectare but out of that palm oil is having just 3 lakh hectares very 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 less so from 3 lakh hectares to we want to increase it to at least 6.5 lakh hectares similarly production from 3 lakh tons to 11 lakh tons total oil seed production 33 million tons out of that palm oil just 3 lakh tons okay again very less so from 3 lakh ton we want to increase it to at least 11 lakh ton so there can be decrease in the import bill fine so what are the benefits of this scheme how this scheme can be benefit so atmanirbhar in the edible oils atmanirbhar you might be you might have heard this word several times in the recent times okay next higher yield generally when we compare with respect to other oil seeds like sunflower in one hectare of land we can produce almost 5000 kgs of palm oil but with respect to sunflower oil let us say it will be just 500 kgs so 10 times more yield will be there with respect to palm oil so just by increasing the see if you observe here here how much we have increased the land area two times around but how much production is increasing almost three times because there is higher yield with respect to palm oil okay next low maintenance cost palm oil generally very low maintenance cost similarly higher income levels of the people and boost job creation in the food processing sector because from oil seed to create edible oil it is food processing only okay next reduce oil import bill how much it is 75000 crores not a small number okay so that is with respect to oil palm or oil seeds next second initiative under agriculture 
what is this promotion of natural farming in india first of all we need to understand a little bit difference between organic farming and natural farming so understand very simple difference in organic farming we can use external assistance or external inputs but those inputs have to be organic those inputs have to be natural but in natural farming we cannot use any external input understood the main difference in organic farming we can use external input we can use fertilizer but that fertilizer has to be organic fertilizer in natural farming we should not use any external inputs like fertilizer and also with respect to land generally what we do plowing in organic farming we can do that but in natural farming we should not disturb the land any kind of external input should not be there in natural farming but in organic farming it can be there but it has to be natural means okay that is the main difference now we will see so philosophy of organic farming using naturally available resources optimally to enhance productivity whatever the resources that are naturally available we are going to use them limited human intervention that means we should not intervene with the land only and leaving things to the nature to manage that is natural farming we should not disturb the land only in natural farming next again as use of chemicals and pesticides yes this is also again as this is also again as but here we are going to use fertilizer but not chemical fertilizer organic fertilizer okay next use of external organic fertilizers yes organic manures like compost vermicompost cow dung manure etc are added to the farms from the external sources but in natural farming no use of external organic manure vermicompost is actually again as natural farming okay it is pro organic farming it is again as natural farming decomposition of organic matter by microbes and earthworms is encouraged and naturally it has to happen we should not use any external means that is the thing similarly efforts needed more efforts required in mixing of manure plowing tilling i told you here plowing will be there plowing tilling etc but in natural farming that won't be there less efforts as there is no plowing tilling weeding just the way it should be natural system okay weed means kalupu even kalupu mokkalu kuda theem anamata okay next approach to vermicompost organic farming is in favor of vermicompost but natural farming is against vermicompost because it is a external means we are not going to encourage that similarly cost involved expensive due to bulk manures organic fertilizer is also external input only but low cost we are doing nothing so very less cost involved so this is the main difference between organic and natural farming there are already questions on this in prelims difference between natural farming and organic farming so very important now schemes with respect to organic farming and also with respect to natural farming we will see so first organic farming organic farming certification schemes so we have two certification schemes under organic farming so what is the first one national program for organic production npop there is already a question on this in 2018 prelims okay national program for organic production so certification for exports so this is targeting exports certification for exports given by apeda agricultural and processed food products export development authority so who is going to give the certification here apeda and this certification is for exports similarly under which ministry commerce and industry not agriculture and farmers welfare always remember this if exports is involved always the ministry will be commerce and industry if it is with respect to agriculture product industrial product any product if export is involved the ministry will be commerce and industry now with respect to domestic market certification for domestic market we have another scheme participatory guarantee system 
and what is the ministry ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare because this is for domestic market the ministry is agriculture and farmers welfare if it is for exports the ministry is commerce and industry okay next scheme for promotion of organic farming so for promoting organic farming what is the scheme we have i think i have already told you this in the class paramparagat krishi vikas yojana okay so under the ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare so what is the main aim pkvy is an elaborated component of soil health management of the major project national mission for sustainable agriculture so understand this there is one mission called national mission for sustainable agriculture under national mission for sustainable agriculture we have one component called soil health management <coughs> for doing that soil health management <coughs> we have introduced one scheme that is paramparagat krishi vikas yojana soil health how is it being disturbed use of chemical fertilizers so instead of chemical fertilizers now we have to use organic farming so that's why the main scheme is national mission for sustainable agriculture under that one component is soil health management under that we have one scheme that is paramparagat krishi vikas yojana fine next under paramparagat krishi vikas yojana organic farming is promoted through the adoption of the organic village <coughs> so you have to remember organic village by cluster approach and pgs certification i have already told you what is pgs certification so this is with respect to paramparagat krishi vikas yojana so this is organic farming next natural farming so with respect to natural farming what is the scheme bharatiya prakritik krishi paddhati okay bpkp and natural farming is prepared promoted as bpkp under a centrally sponsored scheme pradhan what is that paramparagat krishi vikas yojana so again let's go back under sustainable agriculture we have soil health management under that we have paramparagat krishi vikas yojana another submission under this is okay so this is nat organic farming this is natural farming so the scheme mainly emphasizes the exclusion of all synthetic chemical inputs and promotes on farm biomass recycling synthetic chemical is nothing but fertilizers and pesticides okay so this is with respect to natural farming next promotion of millets in india and millets is one of the important topics and also favorite topics of upsc so under this what is the type of question that can be asked discuss the significance of millets in the context of india and analyze the problem in production and also give an account of the government initiatives to increase the production of millets so for all this we are going to discuss some of the government schemes that are there some of the initiatives problems all these things in the next discussion so with respect to millets significance of the millets that means what are the benefits that can be there with the millets so there can be several benefits first health benefits what are the health benefits that can be there with the consumption of millets so first one more nutritious more nutritious that is when compared with rice and wheat rice and wheat from that mostly we will get carbohydrates we don't get much nutrition but from millets we will get nutrition also similarly reduces hidden hunger hidden hunger is with respect to nutrition only general wheat there may not be hunger but there can be hidden hunger because of undernourishment we call it so hidden hunger is nothing but undernourishment so because millets are more nutritious it is going to solve the problem of hidden hunger and meet hdg2 hdg2 is what zero hunger in our first module we have already discussed uh, all the hdgs i have given you so hdg2 zero hunger that is elimination of the hunger next low glycemic index this is the most important benefit with respect to millets so what is that low glycemic index 
So, what is the meaning of glycemic index? It is a value assigned to the foods based on how quickly they increase the blood glucose levels. That means, if we consume rice or wheat because they contain high carbohydrates, our glucose level is going to increase by a substantial amount. But when we consume millets, our glucose level is not going to increase too much. So that we call glycemic index. And millets have very low glycemic index. And for whom it will be useful? Diabetic people. Okay. So this point, whenever you are going to write significance of millets, compulsorily you have to mention. Okay. So these are the health benefits. Several other benefits, environmental benefits. What can be? They require 2.5 times less water than rice. So consumption of water resources will be very less. So it is like a sustainable practice. Fine. Similarly, drought resistant. And millets require very less rainfall. In general, the requirement of millets will be just 30 to 40 centimeters of rainfall. Even maybe less also. But for rice, we require almost more than 100 centimeters of rainfall. And for wheat also, we will be requiring around 70 centimeters of rainfall on an average. But millets, very less. So they are drought resistant also. Similarly, what are the economic benefits with respect to millets? They require very less inputs. Even with respect to water also, they don't require even irrigation facility. But for rice, we require some kind of irrigation facility. But millets, they don't require that also. Similarly, multi-purpose, they can be used as feed and fodder, both the types. And double farmer income in rain-fed areas. Rain-fed area means where there is rainfall and if only there is rainfall, they can grow crops. That means they don't have any irrigation facilities. And in India, almost 53% of the total cultivated land is under rain-fed areas. That means they don't have any irrigation facilities. So in those areas, if you are going to produce millets, it will be beneficial for the farmers. Otherwise, if we take risk and if we grow rice, if there is any drought, there will be huge losses. If we grow wheat, again, there may be huge losses. But millet, because they are drought resistant, there won't be any losses. Okay. So that is the advantage. Next cropping pattern with respect to millets first at the global level so at the global level india is the largest producer this is important so we are the largest producer of millets in the world next at domestic levels area under millet how much it reduced from 28 million hectares in 2008 to 25 million hectares so the area has reduced but next statement increase of production from 40 million ton to 45 area under millets reduced but production it has increased why it has increased because of better varieties of seeds okay and better productivity obviously so even though the area under millets has decreased the production has increased so that is one of the thing you need to remember next largest producers what are the states? Rajasthan, Maharashtra and Karnataka. And I told you, millets, they are generally grown in the drought areas. So, Rajasthan is the best example. We call them arid or semi-arid areas. Generally, millets are grown in the arid or semi-arid areas. And Rajasthan has the largest arid or semi-arid area in India. So, in Rajasthan, millets are grown largely. So, it is the first state. Second, Maharashtra. Third, Karnataka. Okay. Next, with respect to problems associated with millets. First, decline in area, which we have already seen just now. Similarly, decline in consumption. Even people, they are not consuming millets nowadays. Once upon a time, our ancestors, they used to consume millets like ragi, jowar, bajra. But now today, nobody is interested. So, decline in the consumption of millets and unable to realize the export potential. Even though we are the largest producer of millets in the world, our exports of millets is very less. So, we are not exporting to our potential. Okay, That is the point. Next, initiatives with respect to millets. As I have told you, under National Food Security Mission, we will have several things. Just like oil seeds, here we will have core cereals under this, millets will be there. 
Similarly, high MSP for Jowar, Bajra and Ragi. Okay, only for these three. These three we call major millets. But for minor millets, there is no MSP. For major millets, Jowar, Bajra and Ragi, we have high MSP. And inclusion of millets in PDS. That is also one of the initiatives. Similarly, this is very important. International Year of Millets, 2023, next year. So, in 2019 or something, we have celebrated National Year. And 2023 is going to be International Year. At that time, there was one question in mains. Similarly, next year also there can be a question in mains with respect to millets. Because next year it is going to be International Year. Next, strategies needed. So, what are the strategies required to increase the production? First, Dalvai panel, that is Committee on Doubling Farmers Income, it has suggested development of special agri-business zones. So, these are the special agri-business zones are like special economic zones only. But these are with respect to agriculture. Okay. Next, expand coverage of small millets. I told you, only for the major millets, we are going to provide MSP. But we need to expand even for the small millets. Next, explore trade opportunities for boosting exports. We have till now not actually able to export millets in a large manner. Okay. To our potential in general, we can say formation of millets board by Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. Even other states have to follow that similar approach. Next. So, next initiative in the agriculture promotion of Kisan drones. So, in general, how drones are going to be helpful in the agriculture? First, we will see. So, benefits of drone in agriculture. What is the first benefit? Field and soil assessment. Okay. Similarly, massive scale surveillance of the crops. For surveillance also, we can use drones and precision crop spraying. That means, in a specified area, if you want to spray some fertilizer or pesticide, that can be done through drones and digitization of land records. This is one of the major, major, major benefit. And currently, Andhra Pradesh government is going to do digitization of land records by using drones. And Andhra Pradesh government is also going to do mapping of the land areas. And if it gets successful, it is going to solve one of the major problem in the civil courts in India. That is land disputes. Okay. In India, in civil courts, most of the cases are related to land disputes. So, if at all this is going to be successful, one of the major issue that is with respect to land disputes is going to be solved. Okay. Next. Submission on agriculture mechanization. What is the year of launch 2014-15 and nodal ministry, ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare. So, what are the new guidelines under submission of agriculture mechanization? So, first guideline grants up to 100% of the cost of agriculture drones or rupees 10 lakhs. That means, if a drone is going to cost agriculture drone less than 10 lakhs, 100% will be given or more than 10 lakhs up to 10 lakhs will be given. That is the thing, either 100% cost or rupees 10 lakhs, whichever is less for purchase of drones by the purchase of drones by some of the organizations. So, what are those organizations? Farm machinery training and testing institutes. Similarly, ICR. What is ICR? Indian Council of Agriculture Research. ICR institutes. Similarly, Krishi Vignan Kendras and State Agriculture Universities. So, any of them can buy the drones. So, central government is going to provide either 100% of the cost or up to 10 lakhs. So, what is, what are the use? Large scale demonstration of the technology on the farmer's field. So, those organizations are going to buy these drones and they are going to demonstrate the uses of these drones in the agriculture fields. This is just for demonstration purpose. Okay. And similarly, if FPOs are going to do the demonstration, these are all government organizations. But if FPOs, that is farmer producer organizations are going to do the demonstration, they will get 75% of the cost. 
for government organizations either 100 percent or 10 lakhs for fpos it is 75 percent and this is also for demonstration fine so this is with respect to kisan drones next one last project with respect to agriculture kn betwa river linking project so we need to know some facts about this that will be sufficient so the project will transfer surplus water from which river to which river kn river to betwa basin so that we need to remember similarly what about our polavaram project from which river to which river godavari to krishna okay godavari to krishna here kn river to betwa and irrigate the drought prone bundelkhand region and the adjoining areas bundelkhand region it will be in the border of uttar pradesh and madhya pradesh okay next the 230 kilometer concrete canal will pass through what are the districts the district names also you need to remember jansi banda and mahuba districts of uttar pradesh similarly tikamgar panna chatarpur districts of madhya pradesh and this is the most important point here so because of constructing of this river linking project there is going to be one hazard for the one of the important tiger reserves the project involves deforesting a portion of the panna tiger reserve how much approximately 10 percent which is huge and where is it located madhya pradesh so here a question can be directly on the panna tiger reserve they can give panna tiger reserve and they can ask in which state it is located okay on while writing any question on the river linking project in mains you have to write this point so what are the negative effects you have to add this point you can give the case study of kn betwa river linking project on case study and here you can give both benefit and also the hazard okay it can act as a case study so next second theme infrastructure so we have completed agriculture all the initiatives that are there in the agriculture so second one of the important again infrastructure so what is the first and most important in this year budget gati shakti master plan you might have already heard about this so first we will understand what is the importance of infrastructure what are the problems that infrastructure sector is facing and what happened according to the gati shakti master plan and how is it going to resolve those problems and while discussing infrastructure chapter some of these points i have already discussed okay so first of all with respect to importance or significance of infrastructure so what is the first one local multiplier effect that means if at all a road is constructed in any village or town or anything there can be economic development beside that or not so it is called local multiplier effect just because we are going to construct one road there will be economic activity okay similarly job creation which is obvious inclusive growth and reduce logistics cost and vision of atmanirbhar bharat so this is the significance of infrastructure sector with respect to india <coughs> next initiatives in infrastructure some of this we have already discussed in the class first national infrastructure pipeline how much amount 111 lakh crore and what is the division center 39 percent state 40 private 21 but in many books it is given 39 39 and 22 but economic survey has given 39 40 21 and we have to follow the economic survey okay so after that national bank for financing infrastructure and development in the last year's budget it was introduced okay similarly national monetization pipeline so what is this related to it envisages an aggregate monetization of potential of rupees 6 lakhs crore through leasing of remember this word which is very important core assets not all the assets only the core assets of the government or core assets of the public sector so what are the core assets example of central government in sectors such as roads railways power oil and gas telecom civil aviation 
in the next four years so this is the time period here you need to understand the word core in the options while giving a prelims question i can give both core and non core assets but that will be wrong only the core assets okay similarly national investment and infrastructure fund which we have already discussed so next challenges in the infrastructure sector so what are the challenges or problems that are being faced by the infrastructure sector first poor functioning of the ppp investment public private partnership especially in the power and telecom projects okay similarly land and forest clearance issue in terms of delay so if there is any clearance issue and because of the delay is happening what will happen there will be cost overruns the cost of the project will increase if it gets delayed even if it gets delayed by one month the cost will increase the project tender might be of let us say around 1000 crores because of the delay it may increase to 1500 crores and government is not going to pay that obviously okay that is one of the major issue similarly lack of funds in the balance sheet of private infrastructure companies private infrastructure companies they don't have much funds actually with respect to large projects to invest in the large projects okay and lack of effective planning so sometimes planning will be there but won't be effective implementation okay so if there is no effective implementation means there is problem with the plan also okay so there is no effective planning next lack of coordination among the different ministries with one ministry to another ministry there is no coordination if there is no coordination what will happen generally if we are going to construct one railway line and one railway station unless there is road connectivity to this will it be of any use so how it can happen both the connectivity when railway ministry and road ministry if they come together and if they are going to develop a single plan then it will be more useful otherwise railway ministry they are going to construct railway line somewhere and road will be somewhere here what is the use okay that's why there should be coordination between the ministries that is very important with respect to infrastructure projects so under gati shakti master plan what are the features first and foremost important feature it brings together 16 ministries and departments under a single platform okay so that is one of the major feature and monitor the projects worth 100 crores if a project is worth more than 100 crores that will be monitored under this gati shakti master plan next incorporate various schemes under this bharat mala sagar mala udan etc so all the important schemes with respect to infrastructure will be incorporated under a single plan gati shakti master plan and focus on multimodal connectivity multimodal connectivity means road rail water etc so multimodal connectivity we have to focus not a single mode okay similarly leverage spatial technology so using the spatial technology we should be better in planning the infrastructure projects okay while planning the infrastructure projects there should be better approach and we can use the space technology okay similarly what is the nodal ministry dp iit not ministry of finance if i am going to set the paper i am going to give ministry of finance or i may give ministry of road transport but what is the nodal ministry department for promotion and industry and internal trade it is under ministry of commerce and industry okay this department is under the ministry of commerce and industry this is going to be the nodal ministry for the gati shakti master plan not road transport or not ministry of finance okay so how this is going to resolve the problems with respect to infrastructure sector so first one of the problem is no coordination so here we are bringing all the ministries under a single portal so a centralized portal is going to be created and it will ensure greater synergy between the ministries similarly second problem reduce delays and cost overruns so why there is delay and cost overruns because of clearances so now we are going to 
do prioritization of the projects that is one thing and execution of closely linked projects together i told you railway and roadway if they are closely linked we are going to do them in a single manner okay similarly single window approval with respect to clearances so there should not be any delays and there should not be any thing like somewhere here a railway line and somewhere here a road okay and reduce gap between planning and implementation so how are we going to do that adaptation of technology for better planning i told you we are going to use spatial technology similarly provide multimodal connectivity and reduce logistics cost so these are the problems and these are the solutions in the gati shakti master plan so if at all i am going to ask you a question it will be like what are the problems associated with the infrastructure sector in india and how gati shakti master plan will help in resolving those problems that can be a mains question and infrastructure is important for mains not that much important for prelims so question discuss the challenges associated with infrastructure sector in india and also analyze how gati shakti master plan will help in addressing these challenges okay we have discussed them in detail you can easily answer this question next second battery swapping policy so before understanding what is this battery swapping and what is this battery swapping policy in general we will look at electric mobility so what is the need for electric mobility in india so first address the climate change aspect so instead of using petroleum based vehicles we can use electric vehicles which will reduce pollution okay climate change aspect and reduce air pollution that is there and energy security that means our import bill also will reduce with respect to petroleum and natural gas that is energy security similarly present state of electric mobility in india the share of electric vehicles is how much 1.3 percent but in comparison the countries like norway have 75 iceland 45 and china is the largest selling country in the world with respect to electric vehicles next several initiatives in india with respect to electric mobility so first initiative one institutional structure was created that is national council for electric mobility so this council is going to look after all the initiatives under the electric mobility similarly fame you might have heard about this scheme faster adoption and manufacturing of hybrid and electric vehicles in india here you need to understand this word hybrid so if i am going to give you one question on this i can give only electric vehicles but that is wrong not only electric vehicles hybrid vehicles also hybrid means it can have electric vehicle component and also it can have petroleum component that is a hybrid vehicle okay so hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles under the fame india scheme and monitoring authority what is it department of heavy industries not either ministry of renewable energy and not ministry of power it is what department of heavy industries and ministry of heavy industries the ministry will be okay so that is very important aspect here similar not only with respect to fame india in general the nodal ministry for the electric mobility is department of heavy industries that is ministry of heavy industries fine and pli scheme that is product linked incentive that means if you are going to increase the production of electric vehicles in india government is going to provide some incentives in the form of tax benefits so that is also one initiative similarly first loss risk sharing instrument so what is this generally if we go to one bank and ask for a vehicle loan and if you tell you are going to buy one petrol vehicle i mean petrol or diesel based vehicle and i am going to ask for electric vehicle whom the bank is going to give loan for electric vehicle or petrol or diesel vehicle generally petrol or diesel vehicle because they might think providing loan for electrical vehicle may be risky so to avoid that 
what the government has done along with niti ayog and world bank they have created one instrument that is first loss risk sharing instrument of 300 million dollars so here the guarantee will be provided by the niti ayog and world bank third party guarantee that means bank is going to give me loan but guarantee is being provided by niti ayog and world bank in the form of this instrument okay first loss risk sharing instrument that is the meaning and niti ayog has suggested to include electric vehicles to be included in the psl priority sector lending so currently we have renewable energy but we don't have electric vehicles so niti ayog has suggested to include it in the priority sector lending next how it works battery swapping how it works so these are the steps so first buy a e vehicle without battery so we are going to buy one vehicle but it won't have battery so then how it will run so what we are going to do is we are going to go to one company which will provide battery swapping agreement so just like your netflix or hotstar you are going to subscribe to the electric vehicle batteries so you are going to take one vehicle and you are going to subscribe to the battery with respect to some company so what they are going to do they are going to give you battery for subscription so according to this subscription whenever your battery gets discharged so there will limit like 300 kilometers so once you know that the battery is getting discharged again you will go to that stall or company and you will ask for a replacement they will give you a new battery with full recharge so just like petrol how we go to the petrol bank and fill our petrol here there will be stations with respect to electric batteries we are going to go to that station and directly replace the battery okay directly replace a already discharged battery with a recharged battery so that is battery swapping so first process buy electric vehicles without batteries after that lease or subscribe to batteries next replaced drained battery with recharged batteries and after that government is expected to give incentives for leasing or subscription so that is the process so here what is the announcement in this year budget government is going to give incentives for leasing or subscription okay and there is already a success story in this field that is bounce infinity it is a company which has already done 10 lakh battery swaps but by listening it is all looking very good but obviously there will be some problems associated so what are the challenges that can be there so first we will see benefits benefits will be reduce initial cost of the vehicle because while buying a electric vehicle batteries are the 50 percent cost so the cost will reduce <coughs> similarly reduce maintenance cost as customers need not buy new batteries generally if you are going to buy a vehicle with battery after some time you might have to buy new battery but here no need because you are not going to buy battery just you are going to subscribe <coughs> similarly address the problem related to time taken for recharging normally if you are going to own an electric vehicle with battery how much time it will take for recharging this maybe six hours so every day it will be like a extra task for you to recharge this six hours but now no need of that just you need to go to one battery swapping station and you can replace the battery so no need of extra time consumption okay <coughs> okay next challenges only few companies provide removable batteries not all company electric vehicles provide removable batteries that is one of the major challenge similarly interoperability i think in the morning only i told you about this word interoperability what is that 
वन प्लाटा टू अंदर प्लाटा दे रेह सिमिलरली वन कंपनी वेहिकल अदर कंपनी बैटरी अंडरस्टूड लेट से गोइंग टू बै बजाज वेहिकल बट आ I may have to use some Mahindra battery. It may operate or it may not operate, and efficiency also will be there. So interoperability standards that is one of the issue. Similarly, need for more number of electric batteries. Now we will require more number because every day we will be swapping the batteries. Okay, that is also so for that we need to have large production or manufacturing of electric batteries. That is still not there in India. Next, low preference for battery swapping in the two wheelers. Generally, two wheelers they don't prefer battery swapping. Four wheelers they might prefer it, but two wheelers generally they don't prefer. Next, higher GST rate on batteries, 18% slab, which is very high. If you are going to give some incentives, why there is very high GST on this? Okay, that is also one problem. And more usage, what will it lead to? more usage will lead to reduced performance and reduced performance will lead to replacement of older batteries and which will lead to environmental problems because it is going to become e waste what are we going to do with those batteries so that is one of the major environmental problem e waste so these are the challenges associated with the battery swapping so third initiative or third announcement with respect to infrastructure data centers and energy storage systems to be considered as infrastructure so what is there here we are going to consider data centers and energy storage systems as infrastructure so why we need to learn about this first of all who will classify what is infrastructure that we need to know What is infrastructure? Now, they ever classify as such? As ever chapter? That we need to know. And what is the benefit if we classify it as an infrastructure? That also we need to know. Okay. First, who is going to classify something as infrastructure? Similarly, what are the benefits we will get if it is classified as infrastructure? So, first, what is infrastructure and what is the benefit? harmonized list of infrastructure sector it is notified by ministry of finance so ministry of finance is going to give one list that is harmonized list of infrastructure sector only the items in this list will be considered as infrastructure who is providing the list ministry of finance so under five main sectors and 34 sub sectors they have divided infrastructure into five main sectors and 34 sub sectors so what are the five main sectors and what are the examples under those sub sectors we will see so first transport and logistics which is obvious road railway waterway airports pipelines and multimodal logistics park here only thing you need to remember is this multimodal logistics park is also considered as a infrastructure and also pipelines generally these anyway you will remember road railway waterway airports so what you need to remember here pipelines and multimodal logistics park similarly under energy sector generation transmission distribution and storage storage is added in this year budget energy storage system okay next water and sanitation solid waste management irrigation water treatment plants etc so here what you need to remember solid waste management plants even they are included under infrastructure next communication telecommunication towers and services next social and commercial infrastructure education sports hospitals tourism cold chain here the thing you need to remember is the last one exhibition cum convention centers exhibition cum convention centers even they are considered as infrastructure okay so these are the list given by ministry of finance now what is the benefit if it is included under infrastructure so benefits and concessions 
ఫస్ట్ లాంగ్ టర్మ్ క్రెడిట్ అట్ కన్సెషనల్ రేట్ ఫ్రమ్ బ్యాంక్స్ అండ్ ఫైనాన్షియల్ ఇన్స్టిట్యూషన్స్ జనరల్లీ లాంగ్ టర్మ్ క్రెడిట్ ఈజ్ ఓన్లీ గివెన్ టు ఇన్ఫ్రాస్ట్రక్చర్ సెక్టర్ నాట్ టు ఎనీ అదర్ సెక్టర్ సో లాంగ్ టర్మ్ క్రెడిట్ అట్ ఏ కన్సెషనల్ రేట్ విల్ బి గివెన్ బై ద బ్యాంక్స్ అండ్ ఫైనాన్షియల్ ఇన్స్టిట్యూషన్స్ సిమిలర్లీ ఈజియర్ యాక్సెస్ టు లాంగ్ టర్మ్ ఫండ్స్ ఫ్రమ్ ఇన్సూరెన్స్ కంపెనీస్ ఐ థింక్ ఐ హ్యావ్ ఆల్రెడీ టోల్డ్ యూ లాంగ్ టర్మ్ ఫండ్స్ ఆర్ జనరలీ అవైలబుల్ విత్ ఇన్సూరెన్స్ అండ్ పెన్షన్ కంపెనీస్ ఎదర్ పెన్షన్ ఫండ్స్ ఆర్ ఇన్సూరెన్స్ కంపెనీస్ సో వీ కెన్ ఈజీలీ గెట్ ద లోన్స్ ఫ్రమ్ ఇన్సూరెన్స్ కంపెనీస్ ఇఫ్ వీ ఆర్ క్లాసిఫైడ్ యాజ్ ఇన్ఫ్రాస్ట్రక్చర్ సిమిలర్లీ easier access to overseas borrowings through external commercial borrowings generally with respect to external commercial borrowings infrastructure sector has some less like less provisions that means we can easily borrow from other countries and eligible to borrow money from the developmental bank such as india infrastructure financing company limited developmental finance banks we have already discussed them so borrowing from the development banks will be easier if classified as infrastructure example iafl next easier access to investment from the sovereign wealth fund now we need to understand what is this sovereign wealth fund so in countries like dubai and similarly saudi arabia they are already rich countries and most of the times they will have sufficient funds and those funds will be in the form of dollars because while buying the oil we are going to pay them in the dollars so what are they going to do with the dollars that they have they are going to create one sovereign wealth fund sovereign wealth fund will be created by the country sovereign means a country not by a private entity so this fund what they are going to do they are going to invest this fund in several projects in other countries okay they are going to invest this sovereign wealth fund in several projects in other countries because of that their funds will be utilized in a better manner that means they are going to give loans for other countries on that they will get interest okay so easier access to the sovereign wealth fund of other countries if it is classified as infrastructure that is the benefit okay next next initiative scheme for financial assistance to states generally what are the provisions with respect to loans of both center and states so center the article is article 292 under this center can borrow both within india and outside india and the limit can be only decided through law like frbm okay so the limit on center can be only kept by a law and center can borrow both within india and outside india what about states under article 293 borrow from market i already told you stl okay dated securities similarly they can borrow from rbi and also borrow from central government but the borrowing power is limited with respect to states how it is limited states cannot raise loans without the consent of the center that means if there is any outstanding loan or pending loan that the state have with the center then if they have to borrow from other sources they have to take the consent from the center because till now you have not repaid my loan why are you raising another loan so first repay my loan so that is the limited power so states can't raise loan without the consent of the center if there is any outstanding loan given by the center fine and center is empowered to fix borrowing limits of the states center can fix the limits for borrowing limits of the states but for center it can be fixed only through a law but for states center can directly fix the borrowing limits okay that is the difference and tell me here i have told you that both within india and outside india for center can states borrow from outside india yes or no can states borrow from outside india okay i will modify my statement according to constitution according to constitution here there is no provision okay but 
can states borrow from abroad yes from 2017 before 2017 the answer will be no in 2017 financially sound states that means states which are doing good with respect to economy are allowed to borrow directly from the international agencies and for that center is going to act as a guarantor so here center what it will do is state government will provide one guarantee and center will take that and center will give that guarantee to the foreign agency okay it is like a re-guarantee state will give guarantee to the center and the center is going to provide the same guarantee for the international agency so state can borrow but the guarantee will be given by the center okay but this is this is only after 2017 before 2017 not allowed and according to the constitutional provisions not allowed next relief to the state governments to deal with covid 19 situation so increase in the borrowing limit from 3% to 4% of gsdp that means gross state gdp okay and additional 0.5% limit allowed based upon power sector reforms that means if states are going to adopt some power sector reforms additional 5% limit will be allowed with respect to borrowing and andhra pradesh has done power sector reforms that's why center has allowed extra 0.5% limit for ap so next scheme for financial assistance to states this is the actual initiative under this year budget so duration how much 50 years and rate of interest interest free so center is going to provide loans for the states for 50 years and there is no interest and the loan amount allocated in last year's budget 15 thousand crores in this year budget 1 lakh crore okay the limit was increased similarly will these loans be considered for calculation of borrowing limit of the states no i told you there will be borrowing limit on the states but ipudu scheme for financial assistance to the states either the 50 year loans chestundo will they be considered no these loans are over and above the borrowing limits over and above the borrowing limits of the states okay like this center is going to provide financial assistance to the states next so now comes the one of the good thing that bjp government does good mnemonics so what is the scheme name pm divine so what is the full form pm development initiative for northeast region so this is east northeastern region okay very good mnemonic they have converted it into pm divine so what is the objective of this enable livelihood opportunities and plug infrastructural gaps in the northeast region okay and allocation is 1500 crores this is important who is going to implement this northeast council okay that is important here so pm divine it is for the northeastern region infrastructure development that is the first point and implemented by northeast council these are the two main points no need to remember the value next parvat mala program so bharat mala over sagar mala next parvat mala so focus is on development of ropeways in the hilly states so just like roadways and in Sagarmala, what is Sagarmala? Generally waterways. So here it is with respect to ropeways in the hilly areas. Objective, 8 ropeway projects across 60 kilometers in the hilly states. And what is the benefit? It improves connectivity and also boosts livelihood opportunities because ropeways is also one form of tourism. Okay, It also promotes tourism anybody went to Sri Salem there you might have seen the ropeways and in Vizag also Kailash Giri ropeway will be there so it also promotes tourism okay so that is Parvat Mala program and next vibrant villages so what are these vibrant villages the objective is to promote infrastructure development along the northern borders of 
హిమాచల్ ప్రదేశ్ ఉత్తరాఖండ్ అండ్ అరుణాచల్ ప్రదేశ్ నార్దర్న్ బోర్డర్ ఆఫ్ త్రీ స్టేట్స్ వాట్ ఆర్ దోస్ హెచ్పి ఉత్తరాఖండ్ అండ్ అరుణాచల్ ప్రదేశ్ నో టెల్ మీ విత్ విచ్ కంట్రీ దిస్ బార్డర్ విల్ బి దేర్ చైనా సో ద మెయిన్ ఆబ్జెక్టివ్ ఈజ్ వాట్ డెవలపింగ్ వైబ్రెంట్ విలేజెస్ అలాంగ్ ద బార్డర్ ఆఫ్ చైనా ఓకే సో ఇన్స్టెడ్ ఆఫ్ డైరెక్ట్లీ మెన్షనింగ్ దట్ వీ హ్యావ్ మెన్షన్ లైక్ దిస్ నార్దర్న్ బార్డర్స్ ఆఫ్ హిమాచల్ ప్రదేశ్ ఉత్తరాఖండ్ అండ్ అరుణాచల్ ప్రదేశ్ సో ద ఫోకస్ ఈస్ రోడ్స్ హౌసింగ్ ఎలక్ట్రిసిటీ టూరిజం డిటిహెచ్ యాక్సిస్ అండ్ సపోర్ట్ టు లైవ్లీహుడ్ జనరేషన్ సో దీస్ ఆర్ చైనా బార్డర్ ఫైన్ నెక్స్ట్ విత్ రెస్పెక్ట్ టు రైల్వేస్ వాట్ ఆర్ ద ఇనిషియేటివ్స్ వన్ స్టేషన్ వన్ ప్రోడక్ట్ దిస్ ఈస్ ద ఓన్లీ మేజర్ వన్ దీస్ ఆర్ ఆల్ నాట్ దట్ ఇంపార్టెంట్ బట్ జస్ట్ విల్ సీ సో వన్ స్టేషన్ వన్ ప్రోడక్ట్ ఎఫిషియంట్ సప్లై చైన్ ఆఫ్ లోకల్ ప్రోడక్ట్ బెనిఫిట్స్ ఫార్మర్స్ అండ్ ఎంఎస్ఎంఈస్ సో వాట్ ఈస్ దిస్ వన్ స్టేషన్ వన్ ప్రోడక్ట్ దట్ ఈస్ హియర్ ఇట్ ఎయిమ్స్ టు ప్రమోట్ ఏ లోకల్ ప్రోడక్ట్ ఫ్రమ్ ఈచ్ స్టాప్ ఆఫ్ ద ఇండియన్ రైల్వేస్ బై మేకింగ్ ద రైల్వే స్టేషన్ ఆఫ్ దట్ ఏరియా ఏ ప్రమోషనల్ అండ్ సేల్స్ అప్ అంటే ఎట్ ఈచ్ అండ్ ఎవ్రీ రైల్వే స్టేషన్ ఒక స్పెషల్ ప్రోడక్ట్ అనేది మనం స్పెసిఫిక్గా డెవలప్ చేయబోతున్నాం ఆ ఏరియాలో ఏదైతే స్పెషల్ ప్రోడక్ట్ ఉంటుందో దట్ వీఆర్ గోయింగ్ టు ప్రమోట్ అట్ దట్ రైల్వే స్టేషన్ సో దట్ రైల్వే స్టేషన్ ఈజ్ గోయింగ్ టు యాక్ట్ యాజ్ ఏ ప్రమోషనల్ అండ్ సేల్స్ అప్ ఫర్ దట్ ప్రోడక్ట్ సో ఈచ్ రైల్వే స్టేషన్ వన్ ప్రోడక్ట్ ఓకే వన్ రైల్వే స్టేషన్ వన్ ప్రోడక్ట్ నెక్స్ట్ అబౌట్ టూ థౌజండ్ కిలోమీటర్స్ ఆఫ్ రైల్ నెట్వర్క్ విల్ బి బ్రాట్ అండర్ కవచ్ సో ఇన్ ద సెకండ్ పాయింట్ యూ నీడ్ టు అండర్స్టాండ్ ఓన్లీ వన్ థింగ్ వాట్ ఈస్ దిస్ కవచ్ ది ఇండిజినస్లీ డెవలప్డ్ టెక్నాలజీ ఫర్ సేఫ్టీ అండ్ కెపాసిటీ ఇట్ ఈస్ ఏ ఇండిజినస్లీ బిల్ట్ టెక్నాలజీ ఫర్ సేఫ్టీ అండ్ కెపాసిటీ కవచ్ నెక్స్ట్ ఫోర్ హండ్రెడ్ న్యూ జనరేషన్ వన్ డే భారత్ ట్రైన్స్ దీస్ ఆర్ లైక్ హై స్పీడ్ ట్రైన్స్ ఓకే సోఫిస్టికేటెడ్ అండ్ హై స్పీడ్ ట్రైన్స్ సో ఫోర్ హండ్రెడ్ ఎక్స్ట్రా వీ ఆర్ గోయింగ్ టు ఇంట్రడ్యూస్ సిమిలర్లీ హండ్రెడ్ పిఎం గతిశక్తి కార్గో టెర్మినల్స్ వెర్ టు బి డెవలప్డ్ అండర్ పిఎం గతిశక్తి మాస్టర్ ప్లాన్ అండ్ లాస్ట్ ఇంటిగ్రేషన్ ఆఫ్ పోస్టల్ అండ్ రైల్వే నెట్వర్క్స్ టు ప్రొవైడ్ సీమ్లెస్ సొల్యూషన్ ఫర్ మూమెంట్ ఆఫ్ పార్సిల్స్ సో పోస్ట్ ఆఫీసెస్ అండ్ రైల్వేస్ టు బి ఇంటిగ్రేటెడ్ సో దాట్ ఈజీలీ దేర్ కెన్ బి మూమెంట్ ఆఫ్ పార్సిల్స్ ఓకే దీస్ ఆర్ ద ఇనిషియేటివ్స్ మెయిన్లీ యూనిట్ రిమెంబర్ వన్ స్టేషన్ వన్ ప్రోడక్ట్ అండ్ నెక్స్ట్ వాట్ ఈస్ ద మీనింగ్ ఆఫ్ కవచ్ నెక్స్ట్ రోడ్ సెక్టర్ పిఎం గతిశక్తి మాస్టర్ ప్లాన్ ఫర్ ఎక్స్ప్రెస్ వేస్ ఫర్ ఫాస్టర్ మూమెంట్ ఆఫ్ పీపుల్ అండ్ గుడ్స్ సో అగైన్ అండర్ గతిశక్తి మాస్టర్ ప్లాన్ ఎక్స్ప్రెస్ వేస్ ఆర్ టు బి డెవలప్డ్ సో దట్ ఈస్ విత్ రెస్పెక్ట్ టు ద రోడ్ వేస్ సో ఐ థింక్ విత్ దిస్ వన్ మోర్ లాస్ట్ ఇనిషియేటివ్ అండర్ ఇన్ఫ్రాస్ట్రక్చర్ పరివేష్ పోర్టల్ ఐ థింక్ ఇన్ వన్ ఆఫ్ ద క్లాస్ ఐ హ్యావ్ టోల్డ్ యూ అబౌట్ దిస్ so what is this about single window clearance portal for environmental clearances single window portal for environmental clearances developed by ministry of environment forest and climate change okay ministry of environment forest and climate change single window portal for environment clearance uh, we have already discussed one of the major challenge with respect to infrastructure in, in india is clearances and that clearances is also with respect to environment clearance next approvals provided for what are the reasons for which approvals will be provided environmental clearances forest clearances similarly wildlife clearances and crz crz is nothing but coastal area clearance okay so these are the clearances that will be provided under this parvesh portal with this we have also completed infrastructure theme so yesterday we have completed two important themes agriculture and after that infrastructure so today we will be discussing the other things starting with first banking and finance so in the banking and finance you might have already heard about this central bank digital currency announced by the government so on this what type of questions can be asked so one type of question what are the essential features of central bank digital currency and how it can help the government in improving the direct benefit transfers 
So first when we see the uses or benefits of central bank digital currency, you will understand the second part of the question in a better manner. First we will see the essential features and how it can be useful, what are the benefits and what are the challenges, all those things. So, so with respect to a little bit background about this. So interministerial committee led by Subhash Chandra Garg. They have given some recommendations on the virtual currencies. So what are the recommendations they have given? First, ban the private cryptocurrencies. Example of a private cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. So what this committee has suggested? To ban the private cryptocurrencies. And also they have also suggested to introduce central bank digital currency. So based on the recommendations of this committee, RBI came up with the central bank digital currency. So what is the budget announcement? Section 22, this is important. Section 22 of RBI Act 1934 was amended. So under Section 22 of RBI Act, a currency is defined. So till now currency means what? Only notes and coins. But now if we have to include central bank digital currency as a currency, we have to amend the RBI Act. So by amending the RBI Act, that is section 22 of RBI Act 1934, a new currency. Now currency would mean both physical and digital currency. In the only fiscal currency. Now we are also going to include digital currency as also a official currency under RBI Act. Fine. So what is the role of central bank? with respect to this that is RBI. So the role can be direct and the role can be indirect. So if the direct role then both the issuing of the currency and also providing service that means with respect to that current opening a account with directly the RBI and RBI is going to provide all the online services net banking etc etc with respect to digital currency. Then we will say the role of central bank is direct. Otherwise the role of central bank can also be indirect. Like it can issue the central bank digital currency, but service will be provided indirectly to the bank, banks. That means RBI is going to issue the central bank digital currency, but the service will be provided by banks like SBI, ICICI, etc. It is like a third party service. So RBI role can be direct and indirect, both. And it can also be called as a programmable money. So that is also going to be one of the benefit. So what is this programmable money? I have given you the definition here. It is designed with inbuilt rules that constrain the user. I will explain it with one example. Programmable money, let us say it can be, if you are going to give some kind of digital currency in the form of digital form, and I am going to tell you, using this currency, you can only buy certain product like for example using a petrol card you can only buy petrol so we are going to program that card to use only in the petrol bunks similarly while doing direct benefit transfer if we are going to give central bank digital currency in the direct benefit transfer we can say that instead of eliminating ration what we can do we can provide directly cash and we can keep one condition in that only while buying the groceries you can use this money so keeping one condition for using that. So that is programmable money. Understood? So one of the major use of central bank digital currency will be it can be a programmable money. And I have already given you in the question how it can help in the direct benefit transfers. So using this feature of programmable money, it can be very useful. Okay. Similarly, it, it is going to be a legal tender because we have already included it in the section 22 of RBI Act. And also traceability. We can easily trace a digital currency, but we can't trace cash. So that is also one of the important features. Next, difference between central bank digital currency and bank deposits. So bank deposits are the liabilities of the banks. That means if you are going to deposit some amount in the bank, it is a liability for the bank because bank has to provide us interest. Similarly, whenever we ask, bank has to give us that money back. But what about central bank digital currency? Here, RBI is going to be directly liable, not the banks because it is issued by central bank, RBI. In case of bank deposits, who is liable? 
banks. In case of central bank digital currency, it is RBA. Okay. Similarly, there are some examples of central bank digital currencies globally. And generally, what UPSC does is it is going, if at all there is any new initiative in any new sector, they may ask the examples of similar things. For example, in 2019 or 2020, we have made a deal with Russia with respect to S400. You might have heard about this. So, what is this S400 system? Anti-missile system. So, from whom we are going to buy this? Russia. So, S400 is a Russia's defense system. But what UPSC has done, instead of asking about S400, UPSC has asked a question about TARD. It is a similar system of USA. Instead of asking S400, what UPSC has done? It has given a question on the other example, similar. So that's why whenever we are going to read one topic, we also need to see what are the other global examples which are similar. That's why I have given you some of the global examples. So, with respect to Tunisia, E Dinar. Similarly, Ecuador, Sistema. And Venezuela, Petro, Sweden, E Krona. So, these are some of the other examples of central bank digital currencies. And India is not the first country to launch this. Okay. In options, it can be also given like this. India is the first country in the world to launch a central bank digital currency. But that is wrong. Fine. So now, what are the benefits of a central bank digital currency? It is going to reduce cash to GDP ratio. So if it is going to reduce cash to GDP ratio, obviously it is going to promote more and more formalization of the economy. Because most of the cash transactions happen in the informal sector. And I, yesterday only in our class, I think I have already told you this with respect to financial inclusion. If you are going to go cashless, our economy is going to be more formalized. So central bank digital currency is going to help us in that aspect. Similarly, promote financial inclusion. Just the thing which I have already told. And counter private cryptos. Because why we need to counter private cryptos? Because they can be used for illegal purposes. And we can't trace them. If it is a private crypto like Bitcoin, we won't be able to trace it. If people want to really use digital currency, we are going to provide through central bank because it will be easy for us to trace. Otherwise, what will happen if you are going to allow private cryptos, they can be used for illegal purposes. That is one of the major reason. Next, improve cross-border payments. So using digital currency, it will also be easily made cross-border payments. Next, promote fintech sector. So, obviously, if you are going to develop one digital currency, fintech sector means financial technology. So, that sector will also get some boost in India. Okay. So, at a later date, maybe using the digital currency, we can pay through Paytm, PhonePe, etc, etc. So, obviously, Paytm, PhonePe, they are going to get more business. Those are the companies we call fintech, financial technology. Okay. And capture economic activity on a real-time basis. So generally in cash transactions, we can't do this. Capture economic activity on a real time basis. But using the central bank digital currency, we will be able to do that. And how, what will be the, I mean, use if we have done economic, captured the economic activity on a real time basis. Two uses, accurate GDP estimates and similarly, efficient monetary policy formulation. Okay. So, these are the advantages and benefits with respect to central bank digital currency. But just like benefits, there will also be some challenges. So, what are the challenges? First and foremost challenge, disintermediation. So, we need to understand what is this disintermediation. Generally, let us take a bank. Bank is an intermediate between whom? Households. And corporates. So, bank is going to take deposits from the households and it is going to give loans for the corporates. But here the role of bank may decrease of intermediation. How? If we are going to shift towards central bank digital currency, there will be low deposits with the banks. 
obviously deposits in the banks may decrease and if the deposits in the banks will decrease there will be increase in the deposit interest rates if there is going to decrease in the bank deposits what is going to happen they are going to to attract more and more depositors they may charge high interest rates that means they are going to provide us high interest rates on our saving account if they are going to provide high interest on our savings account obviously what will happen they are going to charge more interest rate on the corporate loans now what is the savings rate 3.5% around in SBI so because of this let us assume currently on an average the loans rate is 8% tomorrow to attract more customers they may increase the interest rate to let us say 5% and here it might increase to maybe 13 percent so who is going to lose because of this corporates so it is going to decrease the investment okay if loans become more and more costlier investment will reduce okay so increase in the interest rate on the loans that is going to be the one of the major impact disintermediation similarly higher burden on rbi if direct model is adopted if direct model is adopted what will happen RBI has to look after all the operations also. So there will be more burden on the RBI. Even today RBI has too many functions. And this is going to be one more added function. It is going to be another burden. And reputational risks. If at all there is any security breach with respect to central bank digital currency, public confidence on the RBI is going to reduce. Okay. So that is one of the biggest issue. And data privacy issues loss of right to privacy that means whatever the transactions we are going to do it will it can be traced by the government so right to privacy is missing whatever the transactions we are going to government can track it easily trace it so where is the right to privacy okay that is also one of the major issue and bank runs in terms of bank crisis customers could flee to central bank digital currency so normally what will happen if at all any bank faces any problem then RBI will keep some restrictions like you can't withdraw money something like that but now instead of withdrawing the money we can easily shift to the central bank digital currency because it can be done through online okay so during any bank failures or any bank crisis customers could easily flee to the central bank digital currency okay so that is also one of the disadvantage or challenges so that is with respect to central bank digital currency so next topic surety bonds only you need to understand what is this surety bond now there are three terms here we have obligi principal and surety company so generally whenever normally any infrastructure project is given for tenders what government is going to do is government is going to fix some conditions conditions will be like in five years you have to complete this project with this quality if you are not going to complete this project within five years and with the quality we require then you need to pay some penalty so for paying that penalty government will ask the company to give a guarantee beforehand so if you are not going to do the project within a stipulated time and the, with the conditions we have imposed we are going to impose some penalty for that give us some guarantee so what generally the companies will do the companies will go to some bank like SBI and there they are going to pledge some collateral with respect to their assets and they will take one guarantee and that guarantee let us assume it will be of 100 crores that 100 crores guarantee slip they will again give it to the government normally government projects with respect to road projects they will be in thousands of crores okay so that's why guarantees will be in maybe in hundreds of crores so for hundreds of crores what they are doing they are going to pledge some collateral with the bank and not all the companies may have that much collateral right so here what is happening small companies will be at a disadvantage because small companies they can't pledge that much collateral with the banks so for resolving this problem 
and because of that what is happening there is no level playing field with respect to large company and small company even though small company might be more efficient than a large company just because they can't provide guarantee they will be at a disadvantage so to overcome this problem surety bonds concept got introduced so what is this surety bond now government is going to ask the infrastructure company awards a infrastructure project and lays down timeline and standards now what this company is going to do this company is going to buy one surety bond at a premium so what is the surety bond at a premium from a surety company the surety company can be companies like lic etc now they are going to give a guarantee for the government before we are going to a bank and pledging our collateral asset and from that we are taking guarantee here instead of doing that just like a insurance we are just going to pay some premium and that premium will be let us say 1 crore so 1 crore for 1 crore premium this surety company might give 100 crores bond surety bond no need to pledge 100 crores of assets okay so understood the concept of surety bond instead of pledging our 100 crore asset with a bank now we are going to just buy one surety bond from a surety company at a premium and that surety company is going to provide the guarantee for the government okay so if the principal does not complete the project as per the specification surety company will be required to pay okay so this is the concept so what will be the benefit ensure timely completion of the projects because if they don't complete it is going to be a problem and next encourage efficient infrastructure firms i already told you even though they may not be large companies they may be more efficient so we are going to bring more efficiency similarly boost the insurance sector also for insurance sector also it is going to be a new instrument for them okay so this is with respect to surety bonds next concept digital banking units so what is this digital banking unit they leverage the technology to provide all banking related services at a minimal physical presence very simple they are like 100 percent digital banks which don't have any physical presence just like ola or uber they don't have much physical presence they don't have any offices or anything like that they just operate online so just like that if a bank is going to operate almost 100 percent digitally without any physical presence that means without any bank branch without any atm without anything like credit card or debit card anything like that then we are going to call them digital banks so digital banking units are the units just like a digital bank these units are going to be established by already scheduled banks if scheduled bank is going to establish one digital bank like thing we are going to call it a digital banking unit of that scheduled bank okay so what is the budget announcement with respect to digital banking units 75 digital banking units to be launched by scheduled banks in 75 districts so in 75 districts of india already scheduled banks means sbi icici etc they are going to launch 75 digital banking units across 75 districts this is like a pilot project if this gets successful and with the experience that we are going to learn from this we are going to launch 100% digital banks at a later time okay so this is like a experimentation so what is the need for digital banking units first of all obviously underdeveloped banking sector accessibility financial inclusion is very poor in india currently similarly higher efficiency and also leverage technology to improve financial inclusion we are going to leverage the technology to improve the financial inclusion so these are some of the need or benefits also you can say and present status currently in india there is no provision for license to 100 percent digital banks currently in india we don't provide license for 100 percent digital banks that's why government first want to test this concept through the 75 dbus by the scheduled commercial banks okay similarly based upon the experience of this digital banking units necessary legal and regulatory framework should be issued for the 100 percent digital payment banks so before issuing the license and before framing some regulatory framework or legal framework for it government wants to test this concept 
okay that's why 75 digital banking units were to be established by scheduled banks fine now on all the discussion till we have discussed now there may not be any question in prelims but there may be question on this term what is the meaning of a neo bank or a challenger bank they will just ask which of the following statements will be representing neo bank or a challenger bank so what is a neo bank or a challenger bank neo bank or challenger bank or online only online only financial technology companies that operate solely digitally or through mobile apps that means they are 100 percent digital banks because they are going to challenge the regular banks or traditional banks we are calling them challenger banks or neo banks neo means new okay so this is like a new kind of revolution in the banking that's why we are calling them either neo bank or a challenger bank fine so next topic blended finance so what is the meaning of blended finance afterwards we will see first what is the budget announcement so thematic fund of funds we need to understand this also what is the meaning of a fund of fund for blended finance for sunrise sectors so what is a sunrise sector the sectors which have very high growth potential in the near future that means the sectors which are already growing at a faster pace or have very high growth growth potential in the near future not at a later time okay so such as i have given some examples here agriculture technology digital economy pharma climate action deep tech ai and robotics machine learning big data so these are some of the examples of sunrise sectors in india so on these sectors we are going to for uh, for, that means for investing in these sectors we are going to create one fund of funds in the form of a blended finance so first what is the blended finance blended finance is the strategic use of development finance strategic use of the government's development finance for mobilization of additional finance towards sustainable development this is the point here sustainable development projects if you are going to invest that we are calling as blended finance okay in the developing countries okay so that is the concept of blended finance and we also need to understand what is the meaning of fund of funds from there there can be one prelims question first blended finance it is with respect to sustainable development and we need to understand what is fund of funds so i think in our class i have already explained you what is af alternative investment fund so what is a alternative investment fund in this there will be several investors that can be pooling their money and af will be either a trust or a company alternative investment fund will be either a trust or a company which pulls money from different investors and what it is going to do with that money invest in different sectors and the different sectors can be infrastructure real estate social sector roads railways etc anything so what is the alternative investment fund normal investment how it will happen directly buying the shares or directly doing the investment directly investing in a project or buying the shares of a company but here what we are doing not directly doing it we are going to pool funds through a trust or a company and this trust or a company is going to use the fund they have pooled for investing in different sectors instead of a individual doing a company will be doing that in the form of a alternative investment fund okay so this is a aif now what is fund of funds so fund of funds will be a father fund So it is a government pooled a father fund 
through this we are going to invest in different AIFs. So this will be AIF1, this will be AIF2. So along with the government there will be other investors also. Okay, understood? So fund of funds is like a father fund for the AFs. First, you have already understood what is a AF and one of the examples of AFs, mutual fund. Similarly, REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. Similarly, INVIT, Infrastructure Investment Trust and hedge funds. All these things we have already discussed in the class. Okay. So, AIF will be there and in different AIFs, if government want to invest in the form of some fund, that fund we are going to call it as fund of funds, also called as father fund. Okay. Now, next concept, sovereign green bonds. So, whenever the word sovereign is used, what does that mean? independent or in general we can say government also yesterday i think i have yeah sovereign wealth funds yesterday i have explained you so here it is sovereign green bonds so what is a green bond first of all similar to normal bonds but these are issued to raise finance in the green energy projects it is like a normal bond but what is the purpose of the raising money to invest in green energy projects now, what are the global examples with respect to green bonds? So, first climate awareness bond. It is the first ever green bond issued in Europe. Okay, climate awareness bond. Next, World Bank also issues some kind of green bonds. So, World Bank green bonds is also an example. Similarly, climate bonds initiative. It is an international organization. Even though this is an initiative, the name is like initiative, but it is an international organization which seeks to enable countries to mobilize 100 trillion dollars for financing climate change. It seeks to mobilize the countries for almost a funding of 100 trillion dollars in the climate change. Okay, so what is the name? Climate Bonds Initiative. It is an international organization. Okay, next. <laughs> So, with respect to developments in India, with respect to green bonds. So, first and foremost, in 2016, SEBI issued guidelines for issuance of, I think I have written gold, it is green. Green bonds in India. Okay. So, SEBI issued guidelines for issuance of green bonds in India. And the first ever green bond was actually introduced by Indian Railways. So, it issued green bonds for electrification of the railways. Okay, so by electrification of railways means we are going to actually cut down the diesel aspect. So it is like one kind of promoting or decreasing pollution. Okay, so it is one kind of green project. Okay, similarly Adani Energy they also issued green bonds in 2019. So first it was by Indian Railways. Next, what is the announcement? Government to issue sovereign green bonds. So government just like it is going to issue several bonds. It is now going to issue sovereign green bonds. These bonds to be part of government borrowings. Okay. Just like dated securities, etc. etc. Yesterday we have seen what is what are the components of public debt. So now these bonds are going to be part of the government borrowings. And it will emphasize the government's commitment to the achieving net zero emission by 2070. Okay. Gover our government has announced in the last COP. It wants to achieve net zero emissions by 2070. So by issuing a sovereign green bond, we are going to emphasize our commitment towards that. Okay. So that is one of the advantage of this. Next, anytime, anywhere post office savings. So for achieving this anytime, anywhere post office savings, government has introduced core banking solution of India Post. So what is this core banking solution? So, generally, whenever we are going to withdraw money from any ATM, we are going, 
బ్యాంక్ మనీ అయినా మనం విత్డ్రా చేయొచ్చు కదా సో అండ్ ఆల్ ద బ్యాంక్స్ ఫర్ డూయింగ్ నెట్ బ్యాంకింగ్ ట్రాన్సాక్షన్స్ అండ్ ఆల్ దేర్ షుడ్ బి సమ్ ప్లాట్ఫామ్ విచ్ ఈస్ యాక్చువల్లీ మేకింగ్ ఇట్ టు హ్యాపెన్ ఫ్రమ్ వన్ బ్యాంక్ టు వన్ బ్యాంక్ వీఆర్ డూయింగ్ ఈజీలీ నెట్ బ్యాంకింగ్ ట్రాన్సాక్షన్స్ సిమిలర్లీ యూజింగ్ వన్ బ్యాంక్స్ ఏటీఎం కార్డ్ వీ కెన్ డ్రా మనీ ఫ్రమ్ ఎనదర్ బ్యాంక్ ఏటీఎం సో ఆల్ దీస్ దే ఆర్ యాక్చువల్లీ కనెక్టెడ్ త్రూ వన్ ప్లాట్ఫామ్ దట్ వీ కాల్ సిబిఎస్ కోర్ బ్యాంకింగ్ సొల్యూషన్ now under this core banking solution now india post is also going to come that means the india post deposits that we that means the post office banks that we have discussed already they are going to come under this core banking solution so what will be the advantage now even the people who are holding the post office bank accounts they will be now access to the net banking and all the other services and from any post office bank anywhere in india they can avail the services before what can happen only from the their bank branch they can avail services now because of core banking solution from anywhere in the india they can avail the services and all the 100% of the 1.5 lakh post offices will come on the core banking system okay any post office banks is system ke andar raabothundi fine so networking of what is the advantage of this networking of branches which will enable customers to operate their accounts and avail banking services from any post offices on the cbs network regardless of where they maintain their account and also anywhere anytime banking so these are the advantages of getting the india post under core banking solution cbs no so benefits access to post office accounts through net banking that is one benefit similarly mobile banking and atms i have already explained you these things similarly provide online transfer of funds between post office accounts and the bank accounts now all the online services atm services mobile banking services will now be available to the post office bank customers that is the thing next expert panel for pe or vc investment so what is this pe what is this vc first pe means private equity private equity means private investment in unlisted firms i already told you if a firm is not listed we call it private limited company if it is listed we call it public limited company so the investment in the private investment in the unlisted firms we call it private equity similarly venture capital this also we have already discussed so venture capital means form of private equity which investment made in the startup companies okay venture capitalist means who those who are going to invest in the startup companies here i have also used one more word angel investors angel investor will be individual venture capitalist will be a company investing in another startup okay for example let us say lens cart it is going to invest in another company called cool wings which is a startup then what it will become venture capital otherwise the founder of lens cart let us say piyush bansal he is going to invest in cool wings then what it will become angel investor are there in the difference okay now what is the present scenario with respect to venture capital and private equity so in 2021 companies raised around 77 billion dollars of private equity or venture capital which is huge 77 billion dollars of private equity this is not being done through share market this is being done through private means that means there is no ipo here so without ipo this much amount of shares raising is a huge investment okay which is more than the 60% compared to the previous year when compared to previous year it has raised by almost 60% so we need to do something to regulate this otherwise that is very huge investment we can't let it go just like that so the number of unicorns increased from 11 to 43 now who is a unicorn what are unicorn companies one yeah 1 billion dollars it is like a startup company 
which is yet to be listed, but its valuation is already around $1 billion. Those we call unicorns. So in India, unicorns number increased from 11 in the last financial year to 43 in the current financial year, which is almost four times increase. Okay, so we have to do something with respect to these companies. Some kind of regulation should be there. Okay, so that's why budget announcement, an expert panel will be constituted to look into legal and regulatory framework. So currently there is no legal or regulatory framework with respect to private equity and venture capital. So an expert panel will be constituted by the government to look into the legal and regulatory aspects of private equity and venture capital. That is the budget announcement. Next. So with this we have completed banking and finance. So next theme external sector. So with respect to external sector first and foremost topic SEZ revamping. What is SEZ? Special economic zone. So we will learn in detail about special economic zone now only. Before that one question. What are the challenges and concerns associated with SEZs in India? Discuss what are the steps that can be taken for revamping the SEZ in India so that they become catalysts of growth and development. Currently, what do you think? SEZs in India, were they successful or unsuccessful? Moderate. Moderate. Actually, when compared to China, our SEZs are very, very, very less successful. China's growth rate is because of their SEZs. But in India, SEZs, what they have become is they have become just islands of exports. They have become some foreign territory in India which are doing exports. They are not driving our economic growth rates. But in China, SEZs are also driving the economic growth rates of the country. So instead of they becoming only islands of exports, we have to make them growth catalysts. How to do that? We will see. So what is government going to do? And what are the problems associated? All those things in detail we will see now. So first of all, what is a SEZ? SEZ is a geographically contagious area which is deemed as a foreign territory for taxation purpose. Okay. That means if we take this is the whole territory of India and if we divide it into two parts, one will be SEZ and other will be Domestic Tariff Area, DTA. In the Domestic Tariff Area, what will happen? Whatever the taxes, indirect taxes, direct taxes, all those will be applicable in the Domestic Tariff Area. SEZ will be like a foreign territory. SEZ will be like a foreign territory. And if you have to import something into the domestic tariff area, you have to pay customs duty. Now, because SEZ is a foreign territory, no need to pay any customs duty. Because it is not, we are not going to consider it as a domestic territory. Okay. And we are going to give SEZ several other benefits also. No export duties, no import duties like that. Several benefits. And what is the main aim of promoting SEZs? To promote export-led growth in the India. Promote more and more exports. So, SEZ is a geographically contagious area which is deemed as a foreign territory for the taxation purpose. Other territory we call it Domestic Tariff Area, DTA. Now, SEZs are actually introduced with the passing of SEZ Act 2005. So, what are the provisions in that act? It can be set up by state government, central government or a private entity, a SEZ. And the nodal ministry, this is very important, Ministry of Commerce and Industry. So what is a nodal ministry for that? And I told you, with respect to exports, always what is the ministry? Commerce and Industry. And I told you SEZ's main aspect is exports. So obviously the nodal ministry should be Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Fine. So, what are the benefits that are given to SEZ units? First and foremost benefit, tax benefit for 15 years. Similarly, import duty will be almost zero because we are going to consider it as a foreign territory. And single window approvals will be there and flexible labor laws. Unlike in the domestic tariff area, where the local labor laws will apply, in SEZs, there will be flexibility with the labor laws. 
in domestic areas there will be rigid kind of labor laws but there will be some kind of flexibility in the SEZs okay there won't be that much rigidity so those are the advantages or benefits of SEZs next one note so a little bit background about SEZs in India Asia's first export processing zone so this is one kind of SEZ our main theme of SEZ is export only so in 1967 only we have actually established Asia's first export processing zone which was set up at Kandla Gujarat that means even before China has adopted SCZ policy in India we had one policy called export processing zone okay and later with the introduction of exim policy exim means export import policy in 2000 it led to the SCZ act and later it led to the establishment of SCZs in India so now we are going to reform this SCZ act so we have realized that whatever the purpose because of which we have established SEZs that is not happening so we need to do some major reforms with respect to SEZ act okay so performance analysis currently there are 377 notified SEZs in India the number is actually very huge 377 notified SEZs so this is also one of the major problem in China what will happen is you will see very less SEZs but large SEZs in India too many SEZs but small SEZs economies of scale is not there okay so that is one of the major issue and they have created 2.5 million jobs <laughs> by looking at the number 2.5 million jobs we are we may be thinking that it is a good number but actually not in the context of India there is very high potential which has not yet been realized and most of these jobs are in the IT sector which is also not good generally with the manufacturing sector only our jobs will increase but most of the SEZs are happening in the IT sector. most of the companies in the SEZs are with respect to IT sector and why we need a specific IT sector company in SEZ because from there we are not going to export some goods we are going to export only services and services exports we can do from anywhere why we need to do it from just SEZ okay so that is one of the problem and 26% of the exports it is contributing SEZs are contributing around 26% of our exports note but when compared to China the growth rate is very low of SEZs in India even though the statistics might look good but when compared to China the growth rate is very 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 low so what are the problems associated with SEZs in India so first problems related to tax related problems sunset clause on tax benefits that means after 15 years there won't be any benefit that is one problem and another problem is we have also kept one deadline that means if a company is registered before this deadline only we are going to provide them tax benefits after that we are not going to provide now what is happening if you are not going to provide any tax benefit after the deadline what is the difference between a SEZ company and a normal DTA company almost no difference okay so because of the sunset clause there is one problem and imposition of MAT MAT means minimum alternative tax when we are going to impose minimum alternative tax when a company is availing some tax benefits either using loopholes in the income tax or in general because of availing tax benefits in general they don't have to pay any tax then we are going to impose some minimum alternative tax on their book profits on the book profits of that company we are going to impose one tax called minimum alternative tax and generally the one of the main reason of establishing SEZ is to provide tax benefit and if you are going to impose mat on that the purpose is not being there okay next tax on sale of goods in the DTA that means if a SEZ has to sell their goods in the domestic territory domestic tariff area they have to pay tax like custom duty because we are going to consider it as a foreign territory they have to again pay customs duty which is again not good 
okay so these are some of the problems in the tax related next problems with the approach i have already told you large number of SEZs and a small size of SEZs in china we have small number and large size that is actually sustainable this is unsustainable and similarly 65 percent SEZs dedicated to it or its service sector again which is not good the purpose of establishing SEZs is to improve the manufacturing and also exporting manufactured goods not services services we can do from anywhere okay and similarly located in the hinterland without port connectivity so if our main theme or aim of establishing SEZ is export if we are going to establish them in the inside like anywhere near Delhi or somewhere what is the point they need to be accessible to the ports or not if our main aim is export so that is also not there in China all the most of the major SEZs are connected to the ports so there they are taking the benefit of that okay so that is also one problem and regulatory problems so what is the regulatory entry and exit difficulties no single window approvals generally entry is becoming easy but exit is becoming very difficult and most of the states are not providing single window approvals even though central government might be providing but states are not providing that that is becoming one problem and lack of dedicated codes because we are going to consider them as a foreign territory they don't come under the jurisdiction of our local courts so there needs to be separate arbitration for them because they don't fall under domestic territory so that is also one of the issue and non-optimal utilization of land whatever the land that is being issued for the SEZs non-optimal utilization that is also one of the problem and external challenges foreign companies attracted to other countries due to higher tax benefits for example during the time of covid what is happening more and more companies are leaving china but whatever the companies that are leaving China, where they coming to India? No, they are going to the countries like Bangladesh and Vietnam. Why they are going to even Bangladesh and not India? The reason is high taxes. India corporate tax is almost 25%, which is huge. In Vietnam, it is as low as 10%. In Bangladesh also, it is very low, like 15% or something. So because of those tax benefits, they are going to other countries. So that is also one of the external challenge. Next, signing of FTS enabled DTA units to import intermediate goods at zero custom duty. That means we are going to sign FTA means free trade agreements with most of the countries. Now with Asian country and all, we are signing free trade agreements. And one of the benefit of SEZ is what? They won't have any import duty. But after signing a free trade agreement, anyway domestic tariff area is also getting the imports without any duty. Understood? So there is no specific advantage for the SEZ there. Anyway, domestic tariff area, because of free trade agreement, they are also getting the import at no cost. Okay. So, these are some of the problems associated with SEZs in India. Now, what are the solutions? So, one committee called Baba Kalyani Committee for Revitalizing SEZs. And they have given some recommendations. What needs to be done with respect to SEZs? So, from islands of exports to catalysts of economic growth and development. That is the theme. So, currently SEZs are like a islands of exports but they are not contributing to the growth of India. Then what is the purpose of establishing them? Okay. So, that's why we want to convert them from islands of exports to catalyst of economic growth and development. So, what are the recommendations given by this committee? Shift from export to employment and economic growth. Instead of just focusing on more and more exports, they need to contribute to more employment and economic growth of the country. For that, what we are going to do? Rename the SEZs as 3 E's. So, what is the 3 E? Here I have given Economic Employment Enclaves. 
okay they are going to be economic and employment enclaves which is going to promote more employment and economic growth instead of just promoting exports now we are not going to use SEJs only for the exports we are going to use them for the economic development of the country and also employment generation so that's why now we, we are going to rename them as threes but these are just recommendations government has not yet accepted okay and incentives to industries based on exports employment not only industries we are going to give incentives only based on exports now we are going to give incentives based on export is one of the aspects similarly employment generation value addition and technology adoption before we are providing incentives only based on exports but now we have added other features also similarly second shift from supply driven to demand driven approach so till now we have only focused on supply driven approach that means more and more exports we have to do but now we are going to look at the demand okay and focus on less number of large sized SEJs and SEJs closer to imports SEJs closer to ports and industrial corridors so this is a China's approach which we are going to adopt now till now we have done some mistakes now we are going to rectify them next shift from trade competitiveness to manufacturing competitive trade competitiveness means increasing the trade like import and export instead of doing that we want to increase our manufacturing competitiveness that means more and more manufacturing which will create more and more jobs okay next connecting SEJs with multimodal logistics okay and infrastructure status yesterday I have already discussed what is the benefit of providing infrastructure status to anything okay harmonized list of infrastructure so we are going to provide infrastructure status to the three E's next strengthen the dispute redressal mechanism I told you because they don't come under domestic territory courts won't have any jurisdiction so that's why we are going to create separate arbitration and commercial courts especially for the SEJs and integrating MSMEs in the three E's okay so these are the recommendations given by Baba Kalyani committee for revitalizing SEJs our topic is SEJ revitalizing okay so using all this information you can easily answer any question on the SEJ if it is asked okay we have discussed about SEJ in detail okay so phasing out customs duties concessions on the capital goods and project inputs here we are not going to phase out total custom duty we are going to phase out the custom duty concessions on capital goods what is a capital good these are the goods that will be used to produce other goods like machinery and equipment okay so capital good meaning machinery or equipment used for manufacturing goods rendering services okay and what is the significance of capital goods 12 percent of the manufacturing sector in the total manufacturing sector they contribute to 12 percent and two percent of the india's gdp similarly local multiplier effect that means if one capital goods industry is there using that equipment there can be other industries that can be established so multiplier effect can be there so that is the importance of capital goods industries now what is happening in india is for importing the capital goods that is machinery into india we are providing custom duty concession so if you are going to provide custom duty concession for importing what will happen there won't be any development of capital goods industries in india okay so now government has realized that and it want to remove the concessions on the custom duty with respect to capital goods and project imports okay so what is the present status india is a net importer that is 60 percent demand met through imports 60 percent of the capital good demand is met through imports only and low share in the global exports just 0.8 percent very very less so we want to improve this and for that there are some constraints 
project imports generally what is the meaning of a project import foreign projects like nuclear power plants so if some other country if you want to establish nuclear power plant obviously we will take help from other countries like france russia etc and what they are going to do they are going to directly import all the equipment into india it is like the total project is being imported into india okay that is the meaning of a project import on project imports what we are doing currently 0.5 percent custom duty on the machinery very less okay just 0.5 percent custom duty on machinery for foreign projects like nuclear power plants so now concessional custom duty on the capital goods these are the two constraints which is actually not letting the capital goods industry to develop in india now we are going to do something about this so before that national capital goods policy 2016 what it is saying increase the contribution of capital goods to manufacturing sector currently uh, we have already told 12 percent to 25 percent by 2025 that is the first objective next meet 80 percent currently we are meeting only 40 percent because 60 percent is met through imports so meet 80 percent of the domestic demand of capital goods by 2025 very big target okay we will see whether it will happen or not in the future so what is the budget announcement phase out the custom duty concessions not the whole custom duty whatever the concessions we are providing that we are going to phase out now and we are going to impose some moderate tariff of 7.5 percent on the capital goods and custom duty exemption on advanced machinery has to continue advanced machinery if you don't continue it will be very difficult for our national security etc etc that's why for custom duty exemption will be given to the advanced machinery for normal machinery now we are going to exclude the concessions and we are going to impose just 7.5 percent tariff okay next next theme industry so we have also completed external sector so we are moving to the next theme industry do you want to take a break no okay we'll continue so with respect to industry so what is the first announcement atma nirbharta in the defense sector so higher allocation to procurement from the domestic industry now instead of importing most of the defense products we want to do self that means self-sufficiency in the defense sector now government is going to give more and more projects to the domestic industries instead of giving it to the foreign companies okay so atmanir bartha in the defense sector so that is the first announcement and current government has actually highlighted it a lot okay so just one second okay fine next with respect to msme sector what are the new announcements so the first announcement with respect to msme sector interlinking of multiple portals so with respect to msme sector we have multiple portals now we are going to interlink all those multiple portals so what are those portals udyam portal eshram ncs and asim so what are those portals and what is the use we will see so udyam portal online registration of msmes similarly eshram portal it is for national database of unorganized workers this is for registration and the second is for database of unorganized workers so what will be the use we will know where the workers are present and we using this database we can hire them if you want okay it is just like linking the companies with the workers next national career service facilitates registration of job seekers and the employers those who want job and those who want to employ linking both of them okay national career service next atmanirbhar skilled employee employer mapping 
so this was actually started during the time of covid okay so as in portal mapping the skilled workers with the jobs available okay it is going to map the skilled workers with the jobs available so that they can pursue those jobs so these are the portals which we are going to interlink now next second aspect in the msme sector raising and accelerating msme performance ramp raising and accelerating the msme performance so this program is to be launched and program designed based upon the recommendations of uk sinha committee this committee name you need to remember uk sinha committee and what are the main components what are the recommendations of that committee and what are the main components of this program ramp so first strengthening institutional capacity and coordination by setting up a msme council so for strengthening the institutional mechanism with respect to msme sector we are going to set up one msme council which is going to look after all the aspects and all the schemes and all the implementations with respect to msme sector similarly provide better access to finance while discussing the challenges with respect to msme sector we have discussed all these things in detail one of the issue is finance for msme sector so better ac access to providing finance and working capital for the msmes and also promoting technology i told you technology obsolescence is also one of the challenge with respect to msme sector so promote technology based solutions and green investments and also access to services for women headed businesses okay so technology based solutions one aspect green investments another aspect and access to services for women headed businesses so these are the main objectives of the program ramp so these are the two main initiatives in the msme sector in industry first we have atmanirbharta in the defense after that msme sector interlinking of the portals and second is ramp so next telecom sector so with respect to telecom sector what are the new initiatives that are being implemented so first roll out of 5g in india by 2022 23 in the next financial year similarly what is pli production linked incentives scheme for the design led manufacturing of 5g design led manufacturing means we should not import even the design from other countries so starting from design to everything it has to be done in india so for those production linked we are going to provide incentives okay similarly 5% of usof to be used for broadband and mobile services so i have already given you what is that usof means universal service obligation fund for setting up telecom in the backward areas for setting up telecom services in the backward areas government has created one fund that is universal service obligation fund so 5% of this fund now we are going to use for broadband and mobile services similarly bharat net project i have discussed in detail about this in the class so bharat net project to be executed in ppp mode now public private partnership so this is with respect to telecom sector next theme sustainable development so in sustainable development the first and foremost topic is samarth sustainable agrarian mission on use of agro residue in thermal power plants very simple concept agro residue means like a stubble after the crop there will be whatever the left residue that we call stubble you might have heard about stubble burning and all now what we are going to use do is we are going to make that stubble in some kind of pellets pellets means they are like a small rounded objects in the, in the form of a tablets so just like coal how it will be it will be also something like this coal so just like coal now we are going to convert this all the stubble in the form of small pellets now we are going to use those pellets of the stubble along with the coal in the thermal power plants just like how we are going to blend petrol with other things ethanol we are going to blend coal with the pellets of the biomass okay so what is the objective promote biomass co-firing co-firing means along with coal we are also going to use biomass that we call co-firing 
in thermal power plants and the nodal ministry is ministry of power now what are the benefits it is going to reduce coal consumption and reduce carbon dioxide emissions because from biomass there will be very less emissions of carbon dioxide when compared to coal and similarly efficient utilization of agriculture residue instead of doing stubble burning now it can be used for a better purpose okay and similarly what is the budget announcement all the thermal power plants to use 5 to 7 percent blend of biomass pellets with coal okay now <laughs> All the thermal power plants have to use at least 5 to 7 percent of biomass pellets along with the coal. You understood what is a biomass pellet? Okay. Now, next topic <laughs> promotion of ethanol blended fuel. So, ethanol blended fuel means along with fuel, we are going to blend the ethanol, just like in the co firing, along with coal, we are going to use some percentage of biomass pellets. Here, along with the fuel, we are going to use some percentage of ethanol. So, what is the background? Ethanol blended program was started in 2003. So, at that time, sale of 5% ethanol blended petrol that is the target 5% blending of ethanol with the petrol ethanol blended petrol but the targets of that program is 10% ethanol blending by 2022 but do you think it has happened 10% currently we are at around 8.5% Okay, so 10% it has not happened and raise it further by 20% by 2025. So, and with respect to ethanol, we have one price mechanism called administered price mechanism. So, whenever the concept administered price mechanism means government is going to fix the prices or some other authority is going to fix the prices instead of leaving it to the market. Normally, prices will be decided by the market. If instead of market, some authority is going to fix the prices, then we will call it administered price mechanism. So, with respect to ethanol, who is going to fix the prices? Ethanol produced from sugarcane. Who is going to decide the price? CECA. What is CECA? Actually, it is CCEA. Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. So, next, ethanol produced from the food grains. Who is going to decide by OMCs, oil manufacturing companies? From sugarcane, who is going to decide? Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. And for food grains, oil manufacturing companies. So, that is the difference. Now, present state, I have already told you. 8.5 percent but the target is by 2022 10 percent we have not achieved it okay similarly niti ayog's roadmap for ethanol blending so what is the roadmap address the demand that is currently if the demand is around 1000 liters the supply is just around 700 liters so there is a mismatch between demand and supply the demand is around 1000 liter but the supply is around 700 so we have to address this problem next ensure better design for vehicles for loss of fuel efficiency so instead of using 100 percent petrol if you are going to use blended petrol the vehicle efficiency may reduce a little bit so for this we have to improve the efficiency of the vehicles okay next encourage use of water saving crops such as maize so generally we can make ethanol from rice wheat sugarcane etc but rice wheat sugarcane all these are food crops and they require high water sugarcane requires very high rainfall and sugarcane requires also irrigated facility similarly rice and wheat also require high rainfall Instead of using them as a source for ethanol, we should promote more and more things like maize, <laughs> which requires very less water. Okay. So, what is the budget announcement? Additional basic excise duty of rupees 2 per liter on unblended petrol. So, if the petrol is not blended with ethanol, then a additional excise duty of 2 rupees will be imposed on that petrol okay so it is going to be excess burden on the customer so customer is not going to buy unblended petrol 
fine <laughs> next what are the other initiatives with respect to sustainable development those are the two important topics that why we have discussed them in, in detail just what are the other initiatives promoting agroforestry similarly energy efficiency through energy service company so government is going to establish one energy service company and promotion of circular economy circular economy means recycling okay so recycling we call it circular economy next social sector social sector means generally we will have education health etc and the main ministry under social sector is ministry for women and child development and ministry of health and family welfare these are the two main ministries with respect to education ministry of education now we don't have hrd I hope you already know this. Before last year, we used to have Ministry of HRD, Human Resource Development. Now we have replaced it with Ministry of Education. Fine. So, with respect to health sector, what is the initiative? Ayushman Bharat Digital Health Mission. So, we are going to introduce one digital health mission. So, under this digital health mission, what are the components? First, we are going to issue one digital health ID. This digital health ID will be for the customer or the patients for every patient one digital health id will be provided so they are going to use this digital health id for whatever the services they are going to get under ayushman bar so now what will happen for whichever the hospital they are going to go if their all the record is having in a digital form if they go to some other hospital they need not carry all the files along with them just by clicking by using their digital id we will know the history of that patient so that will be one advantage similarly for healthcare professionals also <coughs> one registry will be created that means even for doctors one registry will be created and for them also one id will be provided not only for the doctors even for the health care facilities that means for hospitals also one id will be provided for patients id for doctors one id similarly for hospitals also one registry and one id will be provided now we are going to track each and every aspect of health in a digital manner but obviously it will take time to improve the infrastructure and all but if it happens it is going to revolutionize the health sector in india okay let us hope it will be successful and who is going to implement this implemented by national health authority under ministry of health and family welfare this national health authority it was created under ayushman bharat mission only fine next with respect to other social sector initiatives first high level committee on urban development so in social sector we will also have urban development aspect so one high level committee is going to be established with respect to urban development not that much important next women empowerment now all the schemes under women empowerment are now actually clubbed into three umbrella schemes mission shakti mission vatsalya saksham anganwadi portion 2.0 we are going to discuss about this in detail later so let us skip it for now and with respect to education and skill development what are the programs one class one tv channel similarly launch of one digital university currently only digital university in india is there in kerala okay now central government is also wants to establish or launch one digital university and digital ecosystem for skilling and livelihood desh what is the name for desh digital ecosystem for skilling and livelihood it is going to be one stack portal to be launched so one portal for skilling and livelihood of the people so these are the education and skill development related initiatives and with respect to aspirational blocks this is for urban sector this is for rural sector this is a separate program as aspirational um, districts program and aspirational blocks from before we used to have aspirational districts program now we want to take it to aspirational blocks program now for this program all the details were not yet provided by the government so we have to wait for some time
off. Now we will see that women empowerment aspect. So, what has happened? Ministry of Women and Child Development, they have classified all the major programs under three umbrella schemes. So, what are those three umbrella schemes? Mission Shakti, Mission Vatsalya, Saksham Anganwadi and Potion 2.0 scheme. So, we will see each of these. First, Mission Shakti. So, under Mission Shakti, it will consist of schemes and policies for empowerment and protection. So, under Mission Shakti, we have two aspects. Women empowerment aspect and women protection aspect. So, whatever the programs that are or schemes under it, that will be included under Mission Shakti. So, what are the... Now, we have divided the schemes under two categories. First category, Sambal. Generally, Sambal means what in Hindi? Balance. Balance. Okay. Sambal means actually protection. It is not balance, protection. Sambal ke ja under. Okay. Be careful. Okay. So, Sambal schemes such as One Stop Center and Mahila Polish Volunteer, Women's Helpline, Swadhar, Ujwala. All these things are included under Sambal. Similarly, Samartya, Beti Bachao, Beti Padao, Matru Vandana Yojana. Here we have divided them into two aspects, empowerment and protection. So, Sambal is with respect to protection and Samartya is with respect to empowerment. So, we have classified the schemes under these aspects. Next mission Vatsalya. It will be looking into the child welfare services and child protection services. Before case it is women protection and women empowerment. Here it is with respect to child. So one of the scheme, scheme for child protection services. Okay. And the third one Saksham Anganwadi and Potion 2.0 scheme. So, what are the schemes under this? Integrated Child Development Scheme, ICDS. You might be already knowing all these things. Anganwadi, Potion Abhiyan, Scheme for Adolescent Girls and National Creed Scheme. What is this? So, it is like a facility provided for children in the offices. Okay. Similarly, what is mission? Potion 2.0. Government will be merging the portion abian and supplementary nutritional program. So currently we have two schemes for nutrition. One is portion abian and the other is supplementary nutrition. Now we are going to combine them under the mission portion 2.0. Now what is the objective? It will look into the ways and measures for strengthening the nutritional content, outreach, delivery and outcomes. So, in general, what you need to remember, we have classified all the schemes under women empowerment under three categories. Mission Shakti, Mission Vatsalya, Saksham Anganwadi and Potion 2.0 and some of the examples. Under Mission Shakti, we have two aspects, Sambal, Samatya. So, Mission Shakti is with respect to women empowerment and women protection. Second, Mission Vatsalya is with respect to child protection and child services. And the third one is with respect to nutrition, nutritional aspect. Next, the last topic for today, important tax proposals that are actually initiated in the budget. So, first, scheme for taxation of virtual digital assets. So, virtual digital asset is like a cryptocurrency. Till now, government actually wants to ban the cryptocurrencies. But because of the order given by the Supreme Court, government is not able to do it. So, instead of banning them, now government is actually proposing to impose some tax on them. Okay. Now, on the virtual digital assets, like cryptocurrencies now government is going to impose taxation so what is the budget announcement 30 percent tax on income from the virtual digital assets that means because of holding some virtual digital asset like a bitcoin you will be getting some income on that income government is going to impose 30 percent income tax Okay, on virtual digital, whatever the income you are going to earn from them, 30% tax will be imposed. Similarly, tax deduction at source on payment made in relation to the transfer of virtual digital asset. That means from a person A to person B, 
if person b is selling you one virtual digital asset for that you have to pay some payment let us assume the payment is around 10000 rupees or 1 lakh rupees let us say it is around 1 lakh rupees on that 1 lakh rupees 1 percent means how much around 1000 100 1000 1000 so 99000 you are going to pay to person b 1000 you are going to pay to the central government in the form of tax tax reduction at the source whenever a transaction is going to happen 99% will go to the person B and 1% will be transferred to the central government okay whatever the payment you are going to made in relation to the virtual digital asset 1% but this 1% will be above certain monetary threshold government might keep that threshold as like 50,000 above if you are going to do transaction above 50,000 you have to pay 1% TDS and in general TDS I have already explained with other example also if you are going to withdraw to more than 20 lakhs in cash from your bank account in a financial year what is the percentage of TDS 2% this is if you are not going to file ITR generally most of you might be not filing any ITR let us assume there will be some amount in your bank account like 30 lakhs now you want to withdraw all those 30 lakhs in the form of cash because you are not at filing any income tax returns if you want to withdraw 30 lakhs in cash after 20 lakhs whatever the amount you are going to withdraw on that that means now you are going to withdraw 10 lakhs extra on this 10 lakhs there will be 2 percent tax and this 2 percent tax who will deduct from your account your bank okay so about 20 lakhs currently if you want to withdraw without filing any ITR there will be 2 percent TDS and why government is imposing this to discourage cash transactions or cash withdrawals if you are filing ITR based on your ITRs the limit will be increased to 2 crore 5 crore like that okay if you are not going to file any ITR it will be 20 lakhs limit and after that even if you withdraw for other purpose not at a single time yet any time when you are going to withdraw money from bank there will be always two percent which will be deducted beyond 20 lakhs okay so here tds with respect to transaction made using any virtual digital asset i have just given meaning of a virtual digital asset so what is a virtual digital asset it means any information or code or number or token but here central bank digital currency also comes under virtual digital asset but here we are calling them virtual digital asset not virtual digital currency central bank digital currency will be a official currency because now it is recognized under the section 22 of rbi act but these virtual digital assets they are not recognized that's why we don't call them currency they don't come under the definition of currency in india fine so either they should be in the form of information code number or token not being a indian currency or any foreign currency generated through cryptographic means example bitcoin ethereum ripple and doji coin okay so these are the examples of virtual digital assets next changes in the tax structure for the cooperative societies so before what is the scenario and now what is the scenario so if you observe here income up to 10,000 for cooperative societies the tax rate is 10 percent so in these three aspects there is no change 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent same same limits same percentage but the change happened here with respect to surcharge so what is a surcharge it is like a tax on tax for example there is one on one crore rupee we are going to impose 10 percent tax and one percent surcharge let us assume so it will be like 10 percent of 1 crore plus what is the 10 percent of 1 crore 10 lakhs so 1 percent of 10 lakh tax on tax that will be surcharge so this is the surcharge 1 percent surcharge 
tax on tax. So, here surcharge is applicable on income of more than 1 crore. So, with respect to cooperative societies, if income is more than 1 crore, there will be a surcharge. Here I have given some similar example, 30 percent of 1 crore and 12 percent of 30 lakhs. There I have given 10 percent, that is why it became 10 lakhs. Here I have given 30 percent, that is why it became 30 lakhs. Okay. So, currently what is the amount of surcharge before? That means before this year budget announcement, it was 12 percent if the income is more than 1 crore. Now, what we have changed? We have kept two limits. From 1 crore to 10 crores, the surcharge is 7 percent. From seven, above 10 crore, the surcharge will be 12 percent. Okay. So, we have decreased the surcharge between 1 crore to 10 crore. Similarly, alternative minimum tax from 18.5 percent, we have decreased it to 15 percent. I have already told you what is minimum alternative tax. If at all any company is availing any tax benefits or if it is not going to pay any taxes, we are going to impose some minimum alternative tax on its book profits. That we call minimum alternative tax for corp corporates. Here for cooperative societies, we are calling it alternative minimum tax. Okay, similar concept. So, alternative minimum tax reduced from 18.5 to 15. Surcharge two limits were kept before it was 12 percent now 1 crore to 10 crore 7 above 10 crore 12. Next provision of updated tax return generally what happens is at the end of by the end of the financial year you have to file your ITR income tax return but sometimes because of some reasons you may delay of filing your ITR but it is going to be a huge problem. There will be cases on you uh, along with the with respect to the features of income tax act. Now government has given one provision that is you can update your income tax return within two years after your cutoff date is completed but you have to pay some interest on the tax. It is it will be like a small penalty by paying that small penalty you can update your income tax returns even within two years of the cutoff date. Okay. So, this is going to be easy for the customers in general people for filing the income tax returns. Till now it is not there, now it is introduced. Okay. Provision of updated tax return. So, it will allow individuals to update their ITR within two years from the end of the relevant assessment year by paying an additional tax of 25 to 50 percent on tax on interest. So, it will be like a small penalty. This will be beneficial for individual taxpayers who have missed the deadline to file ITR. And next, incentives for startups. So, what is the present scenario? Startup companies get benefit of tax exemption for the first three years provided they are set up before 1st April 2022. That means, if a company is set up after 1st April 2022, they will not get this benefit. But now, the cutoff date was extended to 31st March 2023. One year we have extended the cutoff period. Next, extension of last date for commencement of manufacturing or production. So, just like the startups for manufacturing sector also, if it is a new manufacturing company, we are providing a tax incentive. That is, they have to pay only 15% of the tax. Normally, corporate tax is how much? 25%. So, if it is a new manufacturing company, we are going to provide them tax benefit like they have to pay only 15% tax, but there is one precondition, they should not avail any other tax benefits. If they are not going to avail any other tax benefits, they can pay only 15%. But again, for availing this benefit, there is one cutoff date. Before the cutoff date was 31st March 2023. Now, we have extended the deadline to one year, 31st March 2024. Okay, so new domestic manufacturing company. Here the important point is new. New domestic manufacturing companies may pay concessional tax rate of only 15% provided they do not avail any tax exemption. Okay, so with this I think we have completed our budget session.